Good evening. This lecture, Vizrat Hashem, will be Leilui Nishmat Bracha Batzev Michael Ben Baruch, and also Leilui Nishmat Avram Ben Ephraim, and Leavdi Lerfuat Shanas Dvora Elisheva Batzara Yona Ben Ksia Eliana Iram Bat Korin. Baruch Hashem. Also, the Refuat Heleni Orna Bat Chen Chana. The Tzlacha Bet Shuvah of Daniel Ben Michel. Today was Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Nisan is a good month for the Jewish nation. The Gemara says, There's high potential for salvation in the month of Nisan. The situation in Israel, as you all know, is still terrible. More than six months of war. Some limited success we had here and there, but just about it. Uh, neglecting the situation for more than 20 years while the thousands of thousands of Arab builders making tunnels and every day they get weapons from Iran and from Turkey and from all these enemy countries and expecting that the problem that you created over more than 20 years will be resolved in six months it's a little bit over optimistic we just found out today we know that the Israeli army didn't really have an idea what's going on in Gaza until they went there. Meaning all the intelligence and all the equipment that they have, and in the end they didn't know that much. They didn't know. Because it cannot be that they know that that's what's happening and they sat for 20 years and did nothing. It just cannot be. What are you waiting? By, by the time you wake up, you'll be dead. So... We have a big problem, but the reason I'm starting the lecture tonight with this is because before we came out of Egypt, before Moshe Rabbeinu showed up, the desperation was a lot worse. Today we're desperate, we're upset, we don't have that much hope, we don't know what's going to be, what's the future in a country will be, what's the future in the, of the Jews in the world. Everything now is not clear. But try to imagine the Jewish people for more than 80 years in working camp, their children being, being killed. They have all kinds of other problems. They have no hope. They have no sign of salvation or anything like that whatsoever. And all of a sudden, Moshe shows up. Hashem sent me to save the Jewish nation. More than 80 years they're working. 80 years. The whole state of Israel is not 80 years old. The state. The Holy Land belonged to us for 3,340 uh, years already. But the, but the state is not even 80 years old. After Pesach, there is a date. It's called Hei Be'iyar. You know what it means? Month of Yar, it's the month after Nisan. The fifth of Yar, it's the Israeli Independence Day. That's the biggest scam or the biggest joke, depending on how you want to look at it. Because there's no independence. It's an illusion. There's no independence. Independence means when you're free when you know you're not controlled by America, when you're not controlled by the world, when you're not controlled by your enemies, when you don't live in such fear. And the worst situation is that you have a court inside Israel, 15 wicked judges, Supreme Court, Supreme, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, and they rule the country and they do whatever they want. And they destroy the religion. They destroy the religion. Why they destroy the religion? Because they hate the religion. They hate Hashem. 
The one who made the Supreme Court take over Israel was Professor Aaron Barak Shem Reshaim Irkav, who just in an interview a few months ago we saw, that he put feeling probably for the first time in his life for an interview, just for the show. But a minute after he said that he doesn't believe in God. And, they, they, and the reporter asked him, the state of Israel is democratic Jewish state. That's what we wrote in the declaration of the state of Israel, Jewish democratic state. He told him, which one of the two you like more, the Jewish or the democratic? <coughs> he told him the democratic because I don't know anything about the Jewish. He didn't know how to say Shema Israel Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Even the Russian communist Jews, they knew how to say Shema Israel. <laughs> He didn't know, and this is a professor for law in Harvard. Meaning he's not that stupid, cannot be that stupid. I mean, even though Hussein Obama was also from Harvard and one of the dumbest people I ever saw. So yeah, everything is possible. But Professor Barra is probably an educated person who has, has some brain, and he didn't know how to say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. He's 90 years old, he never learned how to say a few words. The most important sentence in the life of a Jewish person, he doesn't know how to say. Can you believe such thing? So I want to read to you something interesting that I wrote. And then we take it from there. What is the judgment? Bear with me, you see where I'm going to. What will be the din, the verdict? We have one person made a Jew become secular. We have a religious Jew. There's a person named, let's call him Reuven. Reuven came, took this religious Jew and slowly, slowly made him Mechalel Shabbat. He's not religious anymore. And then we have a second person, let's call him Shimon. He actually went and killed a Jew. One made a Jew not religious, and one shot a Jew in the head. If you take them to the Israeli court, what would be the punishment of Reuven? Nothing, not guilty. It's a free world, freedom of speech, democracy. He was entitled to talk to him. Missionary, not missionary. Anybody can say whatever they want. Religion, not religion, anti-religion. No problem. That's a secular law. Then what will be the punishment of Shimon? Life in prison. 30, 40, 40 years in prison. This is the law of the secular people. The law of the communists, the law of the Turkish, the law of Iran, the law of the United States, the law of, I don't know, all these countries. Now I want to read to you a little bit calculation based on the Torah that you understand what we're talking here about. According to the Torah, as bad as the crime of Shimon, which will give him a death penalty, right? Someone who murdered another person will get a death penalty. So as bad as it is to get a death penalty, as nothing whatsoever compared to the punishment that Reuven will get. He may not die right now, but one day he will have to be judged for every sin that this Jew committed because of him and his children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren until the end of days. Trillions of sins, trillions, trillions. That's a lot worse than just one, one sin of murder. One. Multiply 100 or 200 children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren. Every Shabbat they break, everyone they kill, every money they stole, every Lashon Ara they spoke, every horrible thing they ever did in their life. You know, he has to pay for it. So I don't have to tell you now who is worse, right? You got the point. The question is, let's continue to investigate. What will be the case when one person made a Jew commit, become, a, become secular? 
Reuven made that Jew secular. And Shimon killed two people. We say one and one, Gadol, the Gemara say, Gadol HaMachtiyo, Yoter Min HaOrgo. So if you, if you murder him, he's not as bad as if you turned him into a secular Jew. One against one. What's worse? Machtiyo is worse than killing him. But what happens if you kill two people? Is it the same thing yet? The one you made a sinner is still worse than killing two people? What happens if you kill a hundred people? One hundred people were murdered by him, by Shimon. And Reuven made one Jew secular, Mechalel Shabbat. Can we still say that Reuven is a bigger criminal than Shimon? What if Shimon killed five million Jews? And Reuven only made one Jew secular, but in 200 years, 200 years, this Jew that he made, made him like a goy, will, will become millions of people, right? After hundreds of years. Bnei Israel went to Mitzrayim, 70 people, after 210 years, how many came out? More than 3 million. Dead, six in one delivery. Usually it would take more than 200 years. It can take a thousand years to become millions, right? 70 people to become 3 million may take a thousand years. They once made a chart in Israel that one Jew, religious, religious Jew in Israel, in average, let's say, has eight kids. One, the secular people have one point something kids, right? So if a religious person have eight kids, and they have eight kids, it's 64 people in the third generation, right? Avraham is one person. Yitzchak, Yitzchak, it's already one out of eight. And then they, each one of them have eight in average, it's 64. How much is 64 times 8? 500. About 500. That's fourth generation. Fifth generation become how much? 30,000. No, 500 multiplied by 8. How much oh, is that? 4,000 people. That's fourth generation. Fifth generation, 32,000 people. 32,000 people. Fifth generation. Sixth generation? 200. Oh, no, almost 200. 192,000. That's sixth generation. Seventh generation? 192,000 times eight? More than a million and a half. So that means the Gaon Mivilna, that was seven generations ago, 200 years ago, 210 years ago, Seven generations, I have, I used to learn uh, with Rabbi Schwartz, he was a grand, grand, grandson of the Gaon Mivilna, meaning that, that he's, uh, he's the, se the seventh one. The, he's the son of 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 the Gaon Mivilna. You understand? Seven generations. So that means if the Gaon Mivilna, according to this statistic, how many kids he have? A million and a half people if all his children stuck to the formula. So where are all these people? Where are they? You have about two and a half to three million religious Jews in the world. 220 years ago, almost all Jews were religious all over the world. Almost all of them. There were about at least 10 million Jews in the world. If 10 million Jews after 200 years, how many are they supposed to be? If each one become a million and a half, you do the math. Should have been billions. What, how many we are? 15 million. What happened? The answer is assimilation. Almost everyone married a goyim. But we still have to ask, Moshe Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn, he, he actually made 80% of the Jewish nation secular. 80%. 
This was 220 years ago. Each one of them with all his children and grandchildren, it's probably many, many millions of people that he has to be judged for. But we still have to ask, there's still a lot of religious people in the world. How come the religious people in the world staying around the same two and a half, three million people? The answer is because a lot of religious people from the eight kids that they give birth to, one or two or three or five or seven become secular with the influence of the Goish world. You don't need to be a genius. Walk around here in Flatbush and look at the religious kids, how they, how they dress, how they walk in the street with the earpiece, what music they listen to. Some kids, yes, some no. But you can see already the influence. You can go to Mincha and Arvit in some of the shuls here that have minyanim and you look how the people dress. You understand the influence of society on them. You understand it. You don't have to be a genius to see it. Let's go back to my question. So Reuven made one Jew a sinner. Shimon killed two Jews. Can we say that Reuven is still worse than him? And if Shimon killed a hundred, if that's the case, who is worse? Still Reuven is worse or no? He killed a hundred bodies, so he's worse. Mm. The reason I'm asking that is because some big rabbis in the past, they say that David Ben-Gurion is worse than Hitler. Of course, a statement like this makes a lot of people get angry, especially Holocaust survivors or children of Holocaust survivors. How do you dare to compare the first prime minister of Israel to the biggest monster in history? How do you even compare such things? The reason why they get angry is because they never heard about the term Gadola Machtio Yoter Min Aurgo. They don't understand what it means to murder a soul of a person. They only, in their life, you can only murder a body. He is alive and now he's dead. That's it. And for them, it's the worst thing that could have happened because you cannot bring him back to life. So if you murder a person, you are the biggest criminal in their eyes. They don't, they are not even aware of the concept of murdering a soul and making the soul lose the life of eternity. They are not aware there is such a thing, life of eternity. They are not aware that if you murder a soul, it's not just that soul. It's all the children and grandchildren until the end of days. It's a nation. They are not aware of this. That's why when you come and say, whoever say that, yes, that Ben-Gurion or Herzl or all these wicked people, what they did to the Yemenites and to other religious Jews when they came to Israel, cutting their peot, taking away their yarmulke and forcing their children to go to secular schools, Khamenei schools, and now you see the results of it, you have 10 million secular people in Israel almost. So they are, what they did is a spiritual holocaust. Hitler did a physical holocaust, but they did a spiritual holocaust. The question is, let's try to analyze it. Is this an exaggeration or it's actually literal? The, the rabbis in the past that spoke about Ben-Gurion and they said that it's worse than Hitler. Did they really mean it or they were trying just to make a point? What do you think? The problem is you know, I want to tell you something. Before Israel became a state, just when it became a state, two years after, two years, Israel was two years old. The Yemenite in Yaman, everyone was extremely religious. But not just religious. Religious that have nothing in their life besides Torah and the, and the Siddur and modesty and kosher food and simple life like the old days. They decided to live all their great life there in Yemen and to make Aliyah to Israel. Israel was two years old. We finally can go back to the, to the promised land. Now remember, they are the longest exile. They are in Yemen for like 2,600 years. They are never in the history been one Yemeni that is not Shomer Shabbat until today. Never. 
in Yaman. You could not find one Jew that is Mechalel Shabbat ever in the history of Yaman. Can you believe such things? In Faresia or in general? Mechlal. Nobody dared to be Mechalel Shabbat until today. They were strictly religious. They were learning Mara sitting on the floor, holding Mara with handwriting. This is how it was. They decided to walk to Israel. To walk. There was no airplanes. They didn't have money for airplanes, even if there was. Trains you didn't have. Some of them came on donkeys, some on, or, you know, walked. Some of them died on the way. They were robbers, they robbed them. Forty percent of them died in their, in their intention to go to Israel. They robbed them on the way. They stole the Sefer Torah. They stole their uh, handwriting Gmarot. The Gmarot was like a scroll, like a Megillat Esther. That's how they had the Gemara, written with the handwriting. It passed from father to son. When they arrived to Israel, how many arrived? 50,000 Temanim arrived, all religious. They don't know what to do with them. So they built tent, just like they do for the Palestinians now. Israel just ordered 200,000 tents, something like that, big number. Assuming each ten is a hundred bucks, imagine how much we have to spend that we have the murderers have a place to sleep while, they, while we evict them from Rafia. So they, they had to build for them tents and they built for them pachonim in the ma'abarot. They, it's called ma'abara. They put all of them over there. I don't know what was the reason, but that year was the worst winter in the history of Israel. It snowed for one week straight in Israel. It never happened in history. One week snow in Rosh Ha'ayin. Rosh Ha'ayin is the center of Israel. It snowed. It was freezing. They were freezing to death, the Temanim. There's no heat. They were begging the Zionist Reshaim to give them blankets and coats. They said, no, we're not going to give you because you took all your kids out of the school. If you sign that you put back your kids into the secular school, boys and girls, learning against Hashem. Now, when they come to school, the teachers stand by the door, take away their yarmulke, and uh, does not allow them to pray. There's no prayers. And they cannot wash their hands. If they want to eat the sandwich that they bring from home, he does not allow them to do Netilat Yadayim. I can show you an interview of Temani. Today is nine years old. He lived in those days. He, he sent his kids to those places. He said, I went to the teacher. I told him, why you don't let them wash their hands before they eat bread? So it's not necessary. Look, their hands are clean. They didn't touch the mud. What do they need to wash? So why you take away their yarmulke off? He said, it's not yeshiva here. He said, but why don't you let them pray? He said, it's a waste of half an hour a day. It's a waste of time. So they took their kids out. He said, I went to all the families. They were very naive. And they don't let the kids go to the, to the school for weeks. They stay home. They stay home. The parents learn with them. Problem is that you cannot have money. You don't have food. Because in order for you to make money, you have to, be, you have to have a red card. Remember, these Russian communists, they make Israel like Russia. So you have to be a member of the Istadrut, like the union. And the only way to become a member is to come to work on Shabbat. See what they did to them? After all of that, now they're freezing to death. They say, you want blankets and coats? Come and sign that you put back your kids tomorrow to school. If the kids will return to school, you're gonna get blankets. Can you believe such thing? So what did they do? Somehow a miracle happened. In Bnei Brak, they heard that the Temanim in the Ma'abarot are freezing now, such a terrible week. They're freezing to death. So what did they decide to do? They decide to collect coats and blankets from people in Bnei Brak that can donate. This is how life was. So they took a truck with a megaphone 
and they drove in the streets of Nebrak from building to building screaming, anyone who can donate a coat or blanket to Achenu Atemanim, to our brothers, the Yemenites who are freezing to death right now because the wicked Zionim don't want to give them coats because they don't agree to put their kids in their public school. Please come down and bring it. You cannot believe there was not one family who didn't donate. Blanket, coat, here, this is my son, coat. we'll manage. We'll manage with this blanket. We'll, people donate, they fill up the truck with coat. Then another truck, and another truck. Now they have few trucks. But how are they going to let the blankets and the coats go in? They have guards over there. It's like a, like a, like a camp, this Mahabharot. This communist wicked one, they, do not, they will never let the blankets go in. They don't want the Temanim to have access to the people of Nebrak. So how are you going to bring it in? There were a bunch of Chabad Nikim there. Chabad. They say we have an idea. We're going to go to the other side of the Mahabharah. And we're going to start a huge demonstration. We'll make riots. We'll burn things. We'll throw, we'll throw rocks. That they will all get nervous. They will all run to the one, to the one side of the Mahabharah because they're afraid that we're going to break in the, the fence. We'll keep them busy. And the trucks will smuggle in with all the blankets. So they said, but wait a minute. Okay, let's say we're going to do it. Then they see that all the Temanim all of a sudden have coats. They'll take it away from them. They are evil. So they say, you know what? Amatchil ba mitzvah. Omrim lo gemor. You started with a good deed. Don't stop in the middle. Finish it all the way. We have three trucks. What, uh, what, uh, once we download the, the, the blankets and the, and the stuff, what are we going to do? We're going to have empty trucks. What are we going to do? Stuff them with children and bring all the children to Bnei Brak. Big trucks. They took all the Yemenite kids, stuffed them like sardines after they dropped the blankets to their parents, and they told their parents, don't worry. We're going to distribute your children to all the families of Nebrak. Each family will adopt one child until you'll be free from this communist reshaim. All of you will get back your children. And that's how they save this temanim. Do you understand, Rabotai? The people of Nebrak in 1950, this story was. 1950. Two year, Israel was two years old. Huh? How far is Nebrak from where they were? Maybe an hour. <laughs> so that's how we have now a lot of families of Temanim that are still traditional religious, thanks to this story. Now they have the nerve to say that there is Kfiyah Datit that the religious people forcing the religion on them. <laughs> you know what? I tell you what. In life, there is a clever strategy. Strat strategy. What's, the, the, what's this clever strategy? Is when you want to defend yourself, the best defense is offense. You begin to attack your enemy. <coughs> What does it mean? You know you did something wrong. And you know someone is on the way to pay you for what you've done. To punish you. You can sit here and wait for him until he comes and try to say, I'm sorry, it wasn't me, I didn't mean it. But it looks bad. Because you're guilty. Or how are you going to overcome the problem? You begin to attack him. This Rasha, you know what he did to me? He's a, he has the nerve, Aratzachta Vigam Yarashta, not only fired me, not only stole all my commission, now he claims I stole money from him, he's on the way to beat me up. You have to do something about it. Who does this today in the world? Hamas. Hamas, Palestinians, the crooks. They come to murder. Ah, genocide. <laughs> and the world buys their nonsense. Why? Because the world is happy about it. They're not that dumb. Come on. 
I mean, yeah, they're naive. American, European, they're naive. They don't understand who these terrorists are, really. But as dumb as they are, they're not that dumb to buy their stories. It's just good for their own agenda. They are anti-Semites. They enjoy to see the Jews suffer. That's it, very simple. And it always comes down to this. So going back to my question, the people that say that, oh, Ben-Gurion and Moshe Mendelssohn are worse than Hitler, where is the confidence to make such a claim? Now I'm going to tell you something brilliant, but pay attention carefully. When you get an invitation to come to a wedding of your secular relative, I don't know, your cousin, whatever, uh, if the wedding is not a kosher wedding, it's not a religious wedding, not separate men and women, it's all mixed, you know, secular wedding. What would you do? Some people are weak enough to go to the wedding. Even though they're religious, they're afraid what the family would say. So they'll show up, which is a sin. You're not allowed to show up. Some would say, okay, I cannot go to the wedding. It's mixed dancing. I'm not allowed to be there. It's against the Torah. But I go to the chupa. After the chupa, I leave. Sometimes it makes it worse. They get even angrier that you came, but you left in the middle. If you didn't come, you make up an excuse. Oh, I was on my way, something happened, I didn't feel good, I had COVID. <laughs> make an excuse, as, as angry as they are, they forget after a day. But if you came and right after the chupa you left, meaning you were here and you left in the middle before the dancing, they don't understand religion. So it's not always a good idea to come to the chupa and leave, okay? Some people will not go to the chupa, but at least they would say Mazal Tov. They call, sorry, you know I'm religious, I cannot come, I'm so sorry. But I wish you Mazal Tov, Bezrat Hashem, I give you Bracha, your marriage should be good, and you know, all of that. Some people will not even call to say Mazal Tov. I'm not an hypocrite. Mazal Tov for what? For declaring a war against Hashem? I have to tell him Mazal Tov? Better to ignore completely. So you have four groups of people. Some will go and make the scene, some will go to the chupa and leave, some will just say mazal tov, and some will, not, will ignore it completely. Like I didn't get the invitation. Now I want to ask you this. What happens if you get an invitation to your secular relative that is going to get married with his own sister. There are a few people like this in the world, by the way. It's public. They got married, brother and sister. They even have kids. I see all of you are about to faint. It's reality. There are people like this in the world. So now your cousin is going to get married to his own sister. <laughs> you know one normal secular person in the world that wants to marry his sister? The, 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 the society would look at him as a total lunatic. Jews, Jews only. Jews only. Now your cousin or your friend sent you an, an, an invitation in one month from now, I am marrying my own sister. <laughs> or we, he wants to marry his mother. His father died. He wants to marry his mother, to live with her as a husband and wife. Or he wants to marry his daughter. Father, his wife died. He wants to marry now his daughter and make her his wife. I see all of you are moving very nervously in their chairs. So my plan is working. Just want to make a point here that will, hopefully you will never forget in your life. So if you are a decent human being, what will be the reaction to such invitation? Some will call and scream at him, shame on you, you're crazy, you moron, you, 
you lunatic, how do you even dare to do such thing? I'm ashamed that you are my cousin. Why are you sending me such a thing? You're out of your mind. You better stop this nonsense, right? <coughs> Those are people who care about the truth. Some people say, what is it my business? I don't want anything to do with this crazy cousin. From now on, I block him on my phone, block him on my WhatsApp. Never want anything to do with him. That's it, I'm done with him. Right or wrong? Why are you done with him? Maybe he was nice to you. Maybe he gave you some help in the past. Maybe he saved you once or twice from problem. But because you know it's not normal. It's crazy. It's a monster. Marry his own daughter or his sister. I don't want anything to do with someone else. Right? So far everyone agree? Yeah. Will you call to say Mazal Tov? No. You, you know anyone who would call and say Mazal Tov? <coughs> Probably not. The question that I have to ask each one of you is, why not? Either way, it's Isur Karet. The first scenario, your friend, a regular Jew, cousin, secular, going to get married to a girl, secular. As soon as they become intimate, or they're already intimate before the wedding, every time they're together, they have this surkaret. Same thing like sleeping with his own mother or sister or daughter. Same thing. Same punishment by Hashem. Same despicable act. You go with a woman without mikveh, she doesn't go to the mikveh after a period. The Torah says, Ve'elisha benida tumata lo tikrav legalot ervata. It's a karet punishment. Ve'nichretu anefashot ha'em misrael. I cut both of them from, from the permanent life. So if someone goes with his daughter, karet. Goes with his mother, karet. Goes with his girlfriend, who's becoming now his secular wife, also karet. Over here, you call to say mazal tov and apologize you cannot come, or you went to the chupa at least. Over here, you cut him from your life. What's this hypocrisy? Who can explain to me the hypocrisy here? You know everything in life has a source. Can you give me a source why here we behave like this? And here we're perfectly fine with that? Almost perfectly fine? We even say mazal tov? We even send a gift? Why are you sending a gift to these two chilonim? They're committing a sur karet. Same category of crime like being with his own daughter. Would you send him a mazal tov check? If he marries his daughter, no. Would you call to say Mazal Tov? No. Why to this Chiloni you do? Or you even go to say Mazal Tov to the place and leave? Why is there such hypocrisy? You hear the question or no? Then it gets better. The answer is, we are very, very influenced by the Christian world. The Christian messed us up. We lived in their countries in Europe, we lived in the United States, we live in Russia, in all these places, Poland, Ukraine, Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, so many European countries. Over there the Christians were dominant. That until a certain point, the church was the king. They're above the law. And the, the Jews were always a minority, always annoying. They were always hated. They were always showing the Goyim that they live in a lie. Because as long as they see these religious Jews, they know that they are just a copycat, imitators. So they, we were afraid of them because they were very violent. Inquisition, tortures, murder, pogroms. Today they use their slicky tongue to hunt Jews, Christian missionaries. They don't murder anymore, they don't torture like they used to. The Arabs do these things, Muslims. Christians are not violent as they used to be. The ones they saw that any kind of violence did not help to break the Jews, they let go. Now they found a much, much trickier way what do they do? They offer financial help. Come on Sunday, 
What do you need when you have a problem? Come to us. Or they sell their nonsense to ignorant Jews. That's what they do. They hunt some of them. Well, they don't come and torture you. If you're not going to become Christian, we'll chop your head off. These days are over. But in the old days, it was an, a martial life risk with them. One mistake and they chop your head off. So by the Christian, there's no such thing as Sur Nida. You marry your, daughter, your wife, and there's no mikveh, no, none of this thing. But there is a huge sin to marry your daughter, or to marry your sister, or to marry your mother. If a Christian will marry his mother, he will be finished in his community, in his church, or his daughter, or his sister. The goyim, Christian, Muslims, they'll go crazy if they hear such thing. Just as much as Jews will go crazy. So because by Nida the Goim have no problem with that, they never heard of it. There's no such thing, mikveh. We got married and you live with your wife, that's no problem. We got used to take it for granted for the last thousand years. Why? That was a way of life where we grew up. At least the Ashkenazim. We grew up in Europe. Also by Muslims there's no Nida. No nida. Ahmed and Fatma, they get married, no mikveh. So the Sfaradim in the Arab countries, just as much influenced by the culture of the Muslims. There's no such thing nida. But what happened if, uh, if Ahmed want to marry his sister? The Hamash will pay him a visit. If he has a bottle of whiskey in his house, the Hamas will pay him a, vi a visit. Needless to say, if he married his own sister, right? You know what will happen to him, right? So the influence of the Goim influences us more than the influence of the Torah. Do you understand what I'm saying here or no? Why? Why? From here we have a very interesting conclusion. What's the conclusion? That the environment that you live in make a bigger impact on you than anything you learn. No matter what you learn, you learn in yeshiva, you learn in school, you learn whatever you learn, mishnayot, you learn gemara, you learn chumash. If you live among wicked people, you become like them. If you don't learn a lot, but you live among righteous people, you become like them, one way or the other. The environment is everything in life. The most important decision in life is where you're going to go to live. Before you get married, after you get married, is even more critical when you have to raise children. What yeshivot they are there. Today I got a call, someone I haven't heard from for five years. In one phone call I found out that he moved from Florida to Israel. I found out what he does in Israel, but that's not the, the reason why he called me. To, to catch up. There is one rabbi that lives in Givat Zev who wants to move to New York for Parnassa reasons. He's tired of the financial stress over there. He has four boys. The oldest is 10 years old. That means it's probably, I would guess that he's in his 30s, this man, and his wife and his children. They want to move to New York. Now, what is the first question he has before he moves to New York? Depends if you're religious or you're secular. If you're secular, you only care if you're going to have a good job. Whenever the job will be, that's where you're going to go to live. They offer you a job in the casino of Las Vegas. You move to Las Vegas. They offer you a job on a boat. Cruise boat, you live on a boat. They offer you a job in uh, Harlem, you live in Harlem. What about the soul of the children? Who cares about it? My soul is there, my children will also be there. I'm going to send them to public school with all kinds of people. They may be anti Semite, they may be criminal. We'll deal with that when we get to the bridge. 
But the servant of Hashem doesn't move to a place before first thing he check is where is going to be a shivot for my kid. Now this man is Sfaradi. He wants his kids to have Sfaradi, the most strict yeshiva possible. So he asked me, he asked that guy to ask me. He knows I live in New York. Can you ask Rabbi Mizrahi, where is a good yeshiva for kids, my oldest is 10, that I should move to that neighborhood and put my kids in that yeshiva? I, what is the answer? There is no such thing. Said as it is, there is no such thing in New York State. There is one very good yeshiva here in Brooklyn, but it's for Syrians, a teret Torah. It's for the community. And I'm not going to take some Sfaradi from Israel. So they, they need the space for their own people. But regular general Sfaradi yeshivot, you don't have. In Israel, Baruch Hashem, you have plenty. They, been, they made a lot of yeshivot over the years. But here, if you want your kids to be Bnei Torah, you must rely on the Ashkenazim. You don't have. Where are you going to find a yeshiva for kids? Maybe high school, you have few yeshivot here. But for kids, elementary school, Sfaradi only, teaching the tradition of the Sfaradim, Correct me if I'm wrong. If you heard about a place like this, please let me know. I will correct my answer to him. I just haven't heard about it. Besides the very good yeshiva over here for kids, that it's very strict and serious, and Chacham Raful, very important for family that runs the place, but if a regular Sfaradi from the no middle of nowhere wants to move there, they have no room for them. There's plenty of kids around here that needs to be accepted. I'm talking a very religious issue. I'm not talking about those modern places. This is a very strict guy. He first check what's going to be the risk to his children, Neshamot. If he will have no risk, he will move. If he won't find a place where to put his kids, he will suffer poverty in Israel. The heck with the financial. We'll starve. As long as there's no risk to the children. Why? Gadol ha-machtiyo yoter min ha-orgo. Remember this sentence. Making someone not religious or lowering his spiritual level is worse than murdering him physically. That's halakha lemaaseh. You'll be judged accordingly. From there you ask yourself, how is it possible that so many people Children, so many parents send their kids to public school with no fear. No fear. I'm not even talking about now all the anti-Semitism attack. Every day you hear in France, in Holland, so many Arabs in the school, they attack the Jewish kids. And if there are no Arabs, there's anti-Semites Americans or anti-Semite Europeans. You, I don't have to tell you what the brainwash that they made to them against Israel and against the Jews. It's a big risk to put your kids in a public school. But I'm not talking about physical risk. We would live with the anti-Semitism. Once in a while the kid will get few punches. He will get some Nazis bullying him, stealing his money or his food. We manage with Paro, we manage with, this, with these gangs. I'm not worried about that. That's the list of my problem if my kids will get a, a kick or, or a punch once in a while because they are Jewish. There is much bigger threat. They're going to sit with all these monsters, all these infidels, all these heretic kids, and they're all going to become like them. They will all become like them. What do you think? What do you expect from your kids to be? So, Rabotai, let's conclude. By the Goim, you don't have Isur Karet <coughs> for marrying your wife without Mikveh. They don't know about Mikveh. And they have a restriction about marry your relatives. But there is a better answer than this. This one, I started with the answer that is not the best one. Now I'm giving you a better answer. Now I want you to really pay attention. How do we judge people? How do we judge people? Before I answer this question, I first want to ask you, are we allowed to judge people? 
Are we allowed to be judgmental? Yes. What do you think? The answer, not only we are allowed, we must be judgmental with every human being every second of our life. We don't have permission one second to let go of the judgment. One second. Because only stupid people let go. Meaning, you want to send your kid to someone's house for Shabbat. You must investigate who this family are. You have to know what kind of TV they have over there. What your kid's going to see on the screen in the middle of who knows of what. The cleaning lady is going to put something over there. Naked people. You know how modern this family are. You know what they watch. So you have to check. Now if you want to investigate. How do you investigate? You check how they dress. You check what kind of car they drive. You check what kind of food they buy. How strictly kosher they are. And in the end, you come to a conclusion that this family is not religious enough for my kids. It's too much of a risk. Hey, judgmental. Why is so judgmental? Because Hashem told me so. Before I get married to someone, I have to investigate him or her from head to toe a thousand times. To call the teachers, to call the yeshiva, to call the neighbors, to check the medical record. To do tests, Dor Yeshari, maybe she has some kind of a genetic problem. This is all judgmental. Why are you judging people? No, she's Ashkenazia, I have to do Dor Yeshari. If she was Faradi, I wouldn't do it. Why? The Ashkenazim has it more frequent. In Europe, this, this Dor Yeshari is more critical. By the way, today it's not true anymore. It was true 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you were Faradi, you didn't need to do Dor Yeshari. Not anymore. I know a few Sephardi families who didn't do it, and they paid big time for their life. They had kid, paralyzed, wheelchair for the rest of their life, all kinds of other problems. One test with a few hundred dollars will eliminate all of that. One of them needed a medicine that the price was more than a million dollars. You know how much they had to collect from people to buy that medicine? The medicine doesn't cure the girl. Just stop her from deteriorating. Because right now she cannot walk. She needs help with wheels and all kinds of things to move. If you don't give her that million dollar uh, 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 cure, in one year she's going to be totally paralyzed in bed for the rest of her life. To prevent that, you have to pay a million. Such frustration. Or at least if the million would make her walk and run, it was worth any amount. But this is just not to make the situation worse than what it already is. A million dollar a medicine. Did you know some shots cost a million dollars? One shot. So we must be judgmental. I give you an example. You walk on a subway, 1 a.m. There's a guy with a hoodie, looks at you like that. And you have... Um, May spray in your pocket, pepper spray. As soon as you walk into the subway, your hand went into the pocket and removed the cover. That's being judgmental. Why are you judge him like he's some kind of a gangster? He looks like a gangster. Are you a racist? Why? Because he's black with a hoodie, he's a gangster? No. Not every black with a hoodie is a gangster. But reality, there is a chance that he is. I have to be careful. That's what the Torah say. If you go to China and there's some city over there that the crime is the worst in the world. I'm nothing against Chinese. Reality, that city is a dangerous city. Whether they're Chinese or Japanese or black or Persian or Jews. Who cares what they are? Going into that place, my life is in a risk. Yesterday I had a question from Yerushalayim. One girl that she became religious from my lectures years ago. And she asked an interesting question. This is, by the way, the third or the fourth time she asked me, and every time I answer her no. She's looking for a job already a year and a half. She's so righteous, this girl, that she won't take a job 
unless it's fully kosher, Allah hakli. So for instance, one time she found a job that she has to sell something which is something through cable. It's not allowed. To people watch all these terrible things on cable. You're supposed to sell it to the people on the phone or to take their orders. Not allowed. Okay, next. One time, I'm trying to remember, one time she had, oh, she had a job in an office with boys. And all boys are secular. I don't have to tell you how they behave and what kind of curses they say every minute. And she's a religious girl, being surrounded with such monsters in the office. That's an environment for Bat Israel, not allowed. Yesterday she asked a question. I found a kosher job. Girls only, religious company, there's only one problem. In order for me to go to the job from where I live, I have to drive through Shoafat, refugee camp of Palestinian Nazi murderers. She's going to be on a bus. The bus goes through Shoafat. Sometimes they throw hard, sometimes they shoot, who knows. She's desperate for, for a job. She needs, she needs money. What's the answer? Finally, she found a kosher job. But she has to drive through Shoafat five minutes every day. The whole Shoafat is five minutes. The bus goes through there. It's Jerusalem. By the way, it's very close to where all the Americans live. The neighborhoods of the Americans, where Mikdash Melech Yeshiva is and other yeshivot. It's very close to them. But there's some distance. That's walking distance, walking distance from there to there. When you drive from, uh, you come out of the yeshiva, you see the shofar right there in front of your eyes. What's the answer? Allowed or not allowed to take such a job? Huh? Yes? Based on what you say yes? A person allowed to risk his life every day? If you risk your life and nothing happened to you, what happened to you after all? You lose your schuyot. Menakim lo mischuyotav. The Gemara says. The Gemara says. Huh? Menakim lo mischuyot shelo. For instance, if you're gonna go now to a refugee camp full of terrorists, and they will know you're Jewish, and you have to walk there ten minutes to cross to the other side of town. That ten minutes, there is a high chance that someone will stab you there. But if nothing happened, you say, wow, I counted on Hashem and Hashem saved me. Yes, but Hashem took away 5% of your merit, of your schuyot, to save your life. Meaning the Satan was mekatreg in Makom Sakana. Why is he going into such a place? He has to die, he has to die, he has to get stabbed, he has to get injured. Hashem say, you're right, he wasn't supposed to do it. We'll take 5% from his schuyot in his bank account. So what happened to this poor girl? She would want to get a nice job, finally kosher in your office. And every day, back and forth, by one year, by the end of the year, she may have a few thousand shekel, but she will be clean out of all her merits, all her mitzvot. Why? You're not allowed to put yourself in a place of sakana. You're not allowed. I say, shlichei mitzvah enam nizokim. Someone that is a messenger of a mitzvah. You're busy with the mitzvah. You're going to release a Jew, a Jew from a prison. You're going to deliver medicine to some sick person. You're going to teach Torah, to give a shiur. You are busy with the mitzvah. You have special protection that you won't get hurt. Shlilche mitzvah enam nizokim. But this, this rule only applies to a place that there is no danger routinely. Place that there is danger, you can get hurt. And if you didn't get hurt, you lose from your merit guarantee. That's what the Gemara says. means the danger exists. Oh, the danger does not exist. So if you walk here in uh, Coney Island Avenue and you find a job, 
your life is not in a risk. Maybe your soul is in a risk, but your life is not in a risk. Your body is not in a risk. No one will murder you in Coney Island, hopefully. It's not a place that, uh, you know how now the ways have a new feature. When you go to certain areas, it say to you, be careful in the next two minutes. This place has reported many accidents on the entrance to the George Washington Bridge from the Bronx River Expressway. The last mile, before you enter the upper level of George Washington Bridge, the Waze is giving you extra warning. Be alert. This place, a place of danger, Mu'ad le Poranut. <laughs> Why? They have the record of all the accident, 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 you know. It's always traffic there. Why? There's accidents all the time. You know? So, I told them, no, it's not good. But what, what are we going to do? To find a job that is kosher and you have to get there safely, it's not easy. In Israel, it's not easy. Let's move on. So, conclusion of everything we said, I ask, are we allowed to be judgmental? The answer, we must. You must judge every person. You judge by the way he dress, you judge by the way he talk, you judge by how many curses coming out of his mouth, you judge by what kind of show off he puts in his clothes and in his hair. And based on that, you have to assume when you have to be careful from him or where you can join him. You may be wrong in the end. Maybe your impression was wrong in the end. You thought that this guy is some kind of a criminal by the way he dress and talk. In the end, he's a very soft character. He's just putting a show out there. But he's not a dangerous gangster. It's not my problem. If I see a person without a yarmulke serving me food in his house, I came to give something. Someone sent you this. We go to on a flight. You arrive in New York, where is the address? You knock on the door, some woman opened the door with pants, short sleeves, no hair cover, or her husband, no yamaka, TV, blasting loud, loud movies out there. Come, come, we're just starting dinner, join us for dinner. You're not allowed to eat. Why is so judgmental? Maybe it's glad kosher chicken. Maybe the very makpid in kashrut. Some chiloni makpid in kashrut. But they, they only bring kosher food. Some of them eat kosher only in the house. When they go out, they go in. But in the house, they are Jewish. Some, they only eat kosher. They're not going to eat meat or chicken that is not kosher. How do you know if the meat is kosher? How do you know if the kelim was tfulim? They ever took it to the mikveh? How do you know if the parsley or cilantro that they use is not full of bugs? How do you know what kind of broccoli they use? How do you know what kind of flour they use? Did they clean it for worms? Did they clean the flowers? How do you know? There's so many question marks on the table. Maybe they, they, some of the, if it's in Israel, the fruits, the vegetables, they didn't give masrot, no trumot. They buy it from the Arab or from a secular guy. There's no echsher, the, the perot. You don't know if it's meusar, if it's tevel. You don't know anything. Allah. Too many risks, but they will get offended. Okay, at least eat this. Come, I made it. She gives you one kube. <laughs> wow, the wolf has meat inside. Who knows? Maybe it's from a donkey. They <laughs> grinded his meat. So what are you gonna do? If you tell them I'm sorry, I don't eat from your food because you're not religious. I don't have to tell you what they'll think about religion. They ever thought one day they want to be religious, it's over right here. You don't want to be the reason for it. But you also don't want to eat non-kosher meat. It's a catch-22. I'm sure it happened to you, no? It happens a lot, these things. What do you, what do, you do in a case like that? I'm not hungry, anyway. Good luck telling a Bukharian I'm not hungry. <laughs> Good luck with that. I just had halavi or something. If you had halavi, you're allowed to eat meat after. If they give you meat, cheese, 
cheese, something dairy, you can say I just ate meat. That's yeah. a good, a good, good excuse. But if they give you meat, it's not going to help you that you say you just ate cheese. Why? So I have a wonderful solution for you. You say, my doctor does not allow me to eat. My doctor does not allow me to eat. But are you allowed to lie? No. It's not a lie. You think about the Rambam, he's a doctor. My doctor, Rambam is my doctor, I learned Rambam, Shulchan Aruch. My doctor does not allow me to eat. How do you know the Rambam does not allow you to eat meat by a secular person? The Rambam writes in Ilchot Shechita that someone that is Mechalel Shabbat or Oved Kochavim Umazalot, Shechitato Nevela. He made Shechita Bet Yosef. He used to be religious. 20 years as a shochet. Now recently he became a Khalil Shabbat. But he still knows how to, how to slaughter. What changed? Five years ago I was with a long beard. Shrak. Perfect. Checking the knife. Now he's Mechalel Shabbat. The same thing. He's already used to check the knife like a robot. Tak, tak. Chickens like the kaparot. If you eat from it, it's like you ate a dead dog on the street. See the dog with the flies? You come, take a piece from his meat, put it on a grill, and eat it. Same thing. Why? Because the one who slaughtered the animal is Michalel Shabbat, is count 100% like a goy. And when a goy does shechita, it's nevela. So, Rambam writes, so, <laughs> where they buy the meat from? They're not makpit so much. I want to tell you, you know, there was one rabbi, one student, he was learning in yeshiva in Switzerland by the big chacham. What was his name? Rav Kaplowitz? Koppelman. Rabbi Koppelman. He was a very big chacham there in Switzerland. He had yeshiva. Many chachamim came out of there. Well, this chacham came to visit his father here in Brooklyn. Somewhere in Brooklyn. I don't know where. His father has a kosher butcher shop. When he arrived, he had a nice beard, peos, big yamaka, black hat. So, after he was a week or two by his father butcher shop, he saw that his father level of irat shamayim is not good at all. I would be afraid to eat such kind of meat or chickens. But he saw that all the rabbis and all the religious people that come to the butcher shop, not one of them ask about the kashrut. Where you get your meat from? How do I know it's Bet Yosef? Nobody asks. So he asked himself, why nobody asks? Now one person is Now one person is asking me what kashrut this meat is from? What, from what company you, you, you imported the meat? He realized that because they all see him with the beard and the peos, the, the halacha say that a, a person that looks strictly religious serve you food, you don't have to check after him. Chazakana is a religious person. Uh, why else he would make himself such a beard and peos and a hat? What does he need all this custom for? So you don't, you, you're allowed to eat. If, if some chassid from Boro Park He's giving you now a, me a meal to eat. I don't know, pizza he made at home. You have to go check if the, if, the, if the cheese is kosher or not. No. If in the end it wasn't kosher, it's on him. I follow my judgment. Torah told me to be judgmental. In this case, the judgment was favor. Why? It's not a suspect of eating trefot. Even though today everything is possible. I don't know if you remember in Monsi there was somebody like that. For years he made a half of months he eat refot. Why? Who would suspect such a person? So everything is possible, but the people that counted on him, they are not subject to any punishment because they follow Chazaka. He will pay for everyone. But they don't have any guilt 
What can I have done? תוקע בשופר, he's accepting kids to the shiva, he decides which kid will be accepted and which will not. He's in a very high rank over there. He wasn't just a regular religious person. And in the end, look what happened. When it comes to money, everything is possible. But conclusion, so now you come to a person like this, and he wants to feed you, you are afraid to eat by him. Well, I don't know. So this guy is now in a butcher shop. He realized nobody asked because they see me here. They don't believe that someone like me that just came from the yeshiva in Switzerland, from a very important chacham, rabbi there, will serve them not kosher meat. But it's not my business. It's my father's business. It's not such a tzaddik. What did he do? Shave this beard and put a yamaka like Bennett. <laughs> the next day people came. Most people, as soon as they saw him, they turned around and left. They didn't even ask anything. As soon as they saw what he did, we have to go, we'll be back. Some people said, what happened? One, of course, ran quickly to tell the Rebbe. <laughs> My couple, man. Rabbi, your student, chozer b'she'ela. He became fry. Ma? He's one of the best Talmidim we have in Yeshiva. No chance. Rabbi, with what the eye see, you cannot argue. He shaved his entire beard. You should see his yamaka. Looks like a quarter. <laughs> The rabbi got nervous. Witnesses are telling me such thing, I have to check. He called him up. Rebbe! Psh, what a surprise! Who's master Rebbe? Alice Git. Oh, not so Git. <laughs> I hear very bad rumors. I figure I'm not going to jump to conclusion before I speak to you personally. Oh, I know why you're calling. You are worried that I'm off the derech, right? That I'm going off my path. I've never been on the derech more than I am now. I'm on a mission of saving Klal Israel from eating all kinds of questionable meat. What do you mean? Listen, I cannot talk Lashon Hara about my own father. So let's keep it as the meat over there is not always the best. People never ask. Where are you getting from? What kashrut it is? Where was the shochet? Nothing. Because they saw me with a beard and everyone bad it and I, it's on my conscience. Will I go against my own father? Will I tell the people my father sell you meat that is not what you're thinking? I cannot do it. By me being there, that's his kashrut. So right away I look now like a modern orthodox yid. <laughs> when they see me, they immediately ask, where is the kashrut certificate? Where is this meat from? They check carefully now. You get the point or not? So after we establish that we are allowed to be judgmental, now comes the punchline, comes the question. Here comes the question. We judge people based on what we think that it's right to expect from them. I repeat, we have two different Jews. One is strict, one is very modern. Already in our mind, there is a maximum limit how much we can expect from the Hasid and how much we can expect from this modern Jew. From the modern Jew, if we will find out he doesn't have TV, TV in his house, we will be shocked. Wow, what a tzaddik. He doesn't even have TV in his house. By the Hasid, we don't, we're not impressed. Hey Mendel, you have TV? Ma? TV? What is TV? He doesn't know what you want from him. 
מנדל פון בורו פארק, you have TV? חס ושלום, I rather die than not put TV in house. The modern one, oh, I got rid of the TV. It's, it's very bad, why? All day my wife was watching cooking shows. That's the reason you got rid of the TV. The prostitution, the drugs, the curses, the shooting, the heresy that the kids were watching all day and all night, that didn't bother you. What bothered him? That his wife is hooked on baking shows. But that's not really what bothered him. Usually when you have those shows of cooking and baking, the women that give these shows, or the men, somehow they always have the most expensive, beautiful kitchen in a magazine. You don't have kitchens like this. <laughs> and the wife is developing a lot of jealousy. Hey Moshe, look at our kitchen, it's 20 years old, look everything is peeling. Come on, how many times we fixed it already? Why can't you make me a kitchen like this? Katan alecha! Moshe, what is it for you? Come on, you're making it in a week. I'm not worth it, $200,000 kitchen. I gave you two kids and two dogs. <laughs> the pressure is building and this Moshe is a cheapo. $200,000. He rather die than make her a new kitchen. So he got, he got rid of the TV, but not for the right reason. But if we find a modern guy that got rid of the TV because it's dangerous for the neshamos of his kids, we will give him a Nobel Prize winner. The progress of the year, the tzaddik of Brooklyn, or Tinek, or whatever. Why we are so impressed by this modern Orthodox guy? And if the Hasid will tell us that he doesn't have TV, we don't even appreciate it. Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why? Because it's expected from the Hasidish guy. Because we judge people by stigmas that we are used to. And by Hasidim, you don't have TV in their living room. And if one will have, he's a shake it. <laughs> Nobody ask a question about it. Leave him alone, shake it. One Hasid once came to me and said, I want you to speak to my son. I said, what happened? He said, ah, Nebech, became a Shegetz. <laughs> <laughs> I already imagined that he's probably cut off his beard, cut off his payers, got rid of his yamaka, walking with some jeans somewhere. Just what I imagined. I said to him, okay, where is he? Still here in, in months? He said, yes. I said, tell him to come tomorrow at 2 p.m. to come to my house. I see a guy, beard, not very long, but full beard, yamaka, wore uh, pants, I don't remember the color, green maybe, brown, jacket. He wasn't, wear, he wasn't dressed like a Hasid. I started to have a conversation with him. Apparently, he, he learned seven hours every day, and he worked a few hours a day, sell on Amazon some products to make a living. 30 years old, didn't get married. I have very strong, good Ashkafa. He learns the books of the Ramchal, Yezirat Shamayim, such nice midot. His father looks at him as a goy. In his mind, my son became a goy. Why? Because he doesn't dress Hasidish. Why? Because their expectation is, if you change the way you dress, you are porek all. Bnei Israel nigalu mi Mitzrayim, b'glal shelo shinu et leshonam, and lo shinu et levusham. That's very important how you present yourself in public. So, by us, it would look like a joke. No, okay, so he decided that he wants to be a different kind of religious person. But it's very, it's, keep everything, keep Shabbos, keep kosher, learn more than half a day Torah, has wonderful midot, he's not a thief, he's not speaking Lashon Ara. What do you want from him? He's a tzaddik. If Mashiach comes today, he gives him a great V to this guy. Ramash, very nice, Ben Torah. What's his crime? He doesn't want to follow certain customs that he doesn't like. Is it okay? No, it's not okay. I'm not giving him now uh, 
especially Shar Koach. I understand the disappointment of his father. Imagine if he would be Mechalel Shabbat, what his father would do. If that's for him already the end of the, the end of the, the end of everything. Imagine what would happen if he become one of these lefties. What would, what the father would do. So anyway, Rabotai, now we judge people based on what we think is correct to expect from them. We don't expect a secular Jew all of a sudden to be Shomer Nida, Tarat Mishpacha, that he will agree that his wife will go to the mikveh. That's usually one of the last things he will agree. Two weeks of the man not to be in touch with his wife. It's usually not easy. It's easier to convince him to eat kosher, to put filin five minutes a day, say Shema Yisrael, to pray once a day, to begin with something. Maybe to put tzitzit under his clothes that nobody sees, because he's embarrassed what his friends would think. But what, what are the chances to come to a secular guy in his first day that he comes to a lecture, first time he came to a Torah class, and the Rebbe said to him, I want you please, you and your wife, from now on to be fully, to keep Tarat Mishpacha, you have to go to the mikveh, to we can touch her, you have to sleep in two separate beds. What are the odds? We don't even try. Why? Because we think, ah, anyway, he won't agree. Let's go for something he will agree. Can you one month be strictly kosher? Don't eat meat outside. Make sure you eat this, this, that. Can you do that? Maybe there is a chance. I think the best thing to tell them is to shake hands with them that they will watch minimum one hour to a day of a strong speaker. Better not to talk to them about keeping anything. Let them just listen to lectures. The lectures will get them to keep. Every day they'll keep more and more and more and more because they'll feel guilty. They come, they hear a lecture, two hours lecture, and they just found out what does it mean to be Mechanet Shabbat. Next lecture, what does it mean to eat worms when you eat greens? Every day they make a progress. One time they will hear about the horrible scene of Tarat Mishpacha if you don't keep it. If you don't keep Tarat Mishpacha. Wow, I didn't know it's so bad, Rabbi. The, the key to success is education. You educate people with the information that will help them to change. If they don't know what they have to keep, how are they going to change? So we don't expect from a secular person to keep Tarat Mishpacha. Because we don't expect from him to keep Tarat Mishpacha, we learn to live okay with the fact that he lives with his wife without mikveh. We compromise on that matter. Why? Come on, be realistic. You cannot ask from him now to send his wife to the mikveh. Look how they live. They look like two goyim. What is the point of telling him, send her to the mikveh in two weeks, watch yourself? No. So because of that, because according to him, it doesn't feel for a second that he's a criminal, we also got used to it that it's okay what he does, because he doesn't do anything bad intentionally. But for instance, if we would know that he's a hitman, that he's murdering people, he wouldn't be able to say, what am I doing wrong? It's parnasa. It's guilt. I have to make some guilt. We would know that he's a criminal. Why? Because he knows he's a criminal. If he's going to be a big thief or a crook, we will despite him. Why? Because he knows he's a crook. He knows he's a thief. He knows he's cheating his customer every minute. He knows, and we know. That's why we cannot compromise with that, because according to him, he knows that what he does is wrong. But when he does something that he doesn't know is wrong, that according to him, it's fine, we all of a sudden become very forgiving. Listen, listen, it gets deeper. So for instance, when a Jewish single guy have a girlfriend, Jewish single girl, and they're getting married. We 
understand that according to them they do nothing wrong. They don't understand that mixed dancing, wedding, it's a sin. They don't understand what's wrong here. They don't understand that women that dress the way they dress, it's a problem. They, they were born into this reality. They don't understand that the music that the DJ will play, it's all abomination. It's all against Hashem because they grew up with that. And they don't understand the stupidity of mikveh. For them it's some kind of a primitive, old-fashioned custom. What does it have to do with the 21st century? You understand how they think? Because of that, we became very forgiving. Because the Torah is not really the guideline of our life. It's what society is used to, and that's where the problem begins. So I'll give you another example. When the secular guy wants to marry his sister, every secular person in the world, Jew and non-Jews, understand that it's a horrible crime. That it's a mental case. That every secular person you will interview on the street, 99 out of 100 would say that you have to hospitalize both of them in a mental institution. How the secular became so ethical, they never in the history got to a level that they dropped these laws. They always kept them. Their fathers, their grandfathers. Nobody married his sister. Nobody married his mother. Nobody married his daughter. Not by Jews and not by the Goim ever in history. He always had some crazy people, yes. But as society, it was not accepted. Homosexuality. Homosexuality. Until the 60s, early 70s, it was a huge crime. People would go to jail. If today two men sent an invitation to most Jews in the world, come to our married, me and my husband, Isaac and Jacob, are getting married, some people show up, just like it's a regular wedding with a man and a woman, they don't see anything wrong, that's how brainwashed they are. Some people will avoid the event, they're still embarrassed to come to such an event, but they will be hypocrite enough to call and say, Mazel Tov, I'm glad you found your happiness, Jacob. Some people would spit. I don't want anything to do with them. Why? Because they never adapted in their mind that it's okay. Don't sell me this garbage. It was never okay for thousands of years. All of a sudden it became okay. I don't buy it. You have different kind of secular people. Those who already got used to it, they don't see anything wrong with that. Those who never accepted it, it's the most disgusting thing in their mind. Just as bad as Mary's own daughter. By the way, it's the same, pen, the same punishment. Same karet punishment. The same cut you get for being with your daughter, being with your mother, being with your girlfriend without mikveh, or being with a gay man. All four is that penalty, all four is a permanent cut for the soul, for the life of eternity. All four is despicable in the eyes of Hashem, in the eyes of God. So how come the secular agree that to be with your daughter is disgusting, it's terrible, and they don't have any problem giving you even the death penalty? But with gay, ah, come on, leave them alone. What do you care? It's none of your business. You against it, you against it. It's their life. Why? From the massive brainwash. Another few generations, someone that will marry a woman will be a criminal. You wait and see. They will become so dominant, it would bother them that they are crazy people like us who wants to marry the other sex. You're not normal. We have to pass the law. This guy is not normal. He wants to marry a woman. Days like this will come. It already came once in a lifetime. Who knows when? Sodom and Gomorrah. And Hashem killed them all. Because there is a limit to how much God can tolerate. We are now in a much worse situation than Sodom and Gomorrah. Which makes us understand 
It's just a matter of time until Hashem will give the world such punishment. COVID was one smack. Some earthquakes in the world, okay. But it could be something that can def def destroy half of the world. That will, be, will take a hundred years to recuperate. Hashem doesn't have a problem. He saw the earthquake on Friday, how everything was shaking for 20, 30 seconds. If it would be a little bit more, a little bit more, it was 4.8, it would be 6.8 already, you would have now tens of thousands of buildings in Manhattan on the floor with million people dead. What would we do? All your money will be gone. All the money by the banks will be gone. All your property is gone. Even the house that your house, let's say you have a house in upstate who did not collapse, it's already worthless. No one will ever buy it. No one will ever have money to buy it. If you had, if you had planned to move to Israel in six months to sell the house for two million, take the two million and buy a house in Israel, your two million became dust. Why? If everyone in New York lost their homes and property and the money in the bank and all the stocks and the stock market crashed because an earthquake in New York, do you know what it means? The whole stock market is finished. All companies would lose all their value. People would kill each other on the street. What's left after for food? There will be no electric for who knows how many weeks. You won't be able to take a shower for six months probably. People will kill for one piece of bread for potato each other. You will have to hide in a bunker from all the, 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 the robbers out there that goes with the guns to look for food. What do you think is going to happen? You know what it means in earthquake? It's not just, oh, everything is destroyed. If Hashem would press a little bit more, 10% more, a little bit more pressure, we wouldn't be here talking. Our life would be over. Physically and religiously. You wouldn't have a shul, you wouldn't have yeshiva, you wouldn't have minyan, your kids won't be in Talmud Torah. You would have to hide and fight for your life if you have something to eat. We were very close to it. Very close to it. In Japan, they had an earthquake a few years ago. Until today, they're fixing the damages. That's a very rich, strong country. One of the reasons for earthquakes, the Gemara says, Mishkavei Zachar, homosexuality. Abomination. Abomination brings natural disasters. Only, only earthquakes or all natural disasters? All natural disasters. What other... Uh, what other the worst natural disaster that I can think of is either an earthquake or pandemic. Right? There's no bigger natural disaster than this. Hurricanes. Hurricanes are similar to, no, to yeah, earthquakes. What other reasons but uh, 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 men going with men uh, is reasoning for, uh, I have a whole lecture about it, by the way. An hour and a half just about your question. All the reasons why Hashem brings natural disasters to the world. You should watch it. Watch it. All the reasons why... All the reasons in one lecture. Tov, I just want to finish this because time is running out. So... We judge the other person, but what's right in our mind to expect from him. We don't expect from a secular to keep tarat mishpacha. That's why we live with what he does. We're willing to accept him and tolerate him. But we cannot ex <laughs> accept him when he marries sister, because we know that he knows that he's such a criminal. So if he knows that what he does is a crime, we have a problem accept accepting such a person. That's why we'll avoid him and don't want anything to do with him. In our case, Ben Gurion, the first prime minister who cut the peot of the Temanim and did horrible things against the religion, and all his governments and friends and the communist people and the Zionist wicked people were all mean, evil, wicked, selfish people. They hate God, they hate the religion, and they hate religious people. They love communism, they admire the culture of the Goim, their heroes were all kinds of wackos, but they, they disrespected the biggest rabbis and the Chachamim. It's a miracle the Ben Gurion agreed to meet with the Chazonish. It's a miracle. 
That's how wicked they were. Chazonish told him, you have nothing to sell. We have a wagon full of wealth. You have nothing. Your wagon is empty. So Ben Gurion started to give him all the culture of the Goim. We have Dostoyevsky, we have this, we have Shakespeare. <laughs> Chazonish told him, we have the Gemara, we have the Tanaim, we have the Rambam, we have the Ramchal, we have the Shulchan Aruch, the Ari Kadosh, the Gaon Mivilna. Well, you know what it's like? I'll tell you what it's like. Two kids in a school, in public school, arguing which father is, is wealthier. One guy said, my father drives a Rolls Royce. The other guy says, so what? My father has an electric bike. <laughs> he said, my father owns a, a big mansion in Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. It's, it's five floors, Fifth Avenue. He said, we, are, we, have an, we have an apartment in Detroit, in Philadelphia. In, it's $25,000 an apartment there. He's talking about a house that worth $100 million. The other kids say, we have a house in the ghetto of Philadelphia. I once drove to give a lecture in Philadelphia. I stand by the light. I look at the pole. Someone stuck an ad with telephone numbers. You know how people put telephone numbers and you can detach it and call? What was the price of the apartment? $15,000. I would assume that the worst apartment to build will cost probably five, six times more. To build, put floor, walls, electric, plumbing, toilets, sinks, bring all of that with labor, would probably cost you five times more to build. So to, they sell it for about a fifth of what it costs to build. Then one person say, hey, you know, there's a building in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for $80,000, 16 apartments. I said to him, how can it be? That was uh, years ago. I don't think today you have such bargains. So what, what do you mean? He said, just that you understand, it cost them $360,000 to build the building. And now they put it up for sale for 80. Why? Nobody is interested. Nobody wants it. Why? Some areas nobody wants. Nobody wants. So Rabotai, Ben Gurion and his friends were very, very wicked. They hated religion. Whether it's between men to men, whether it's between men to God. Their values were not what the Torah requires. <coughs> but we have general expectation from every human being, religious, not religious, a Jew, not a Jew, from every human being, I don't, I don't say decent human being. Every human being, Ba'asher Usham, in Africa, in the uh, Middle East, in Asia, it doesn't matter where. Every human being you meet, you have a minimum expectation from him. You agree or no? <coughs> so, what is the expectation that we have that he won't be a serial killer, that he won't be a rapist, that he won't be a mass murderer, that he won't be Bernie Madoff, will make so many people miserable. We expect from a person to be a human being. For to be tzaddik and Talmid Chacham and all of that. So when Hitler Imach Shimo did what he did, killing 50 million people, we look at what he have done that is a million times worse than what Ben Gurion did. Ask any human being today, who's worse, Hitler or Ben Gurion? They laugh at you. You're normal? Why are you asking such a question? You don't like Ben Gurion? Fine. He was a bad uh, uh, leader? Fine. You don't like his ideology? Fine. But you can compare him to Hitler? You're normal. Right? That's what it will be the reaction of everyone. Why? Because what Ben-Gurion did 
was expected. What do you want? It's a secular lefty communist. That's the way they are. They did nothing out of the ordinary lifestyle of, the, of what they have. But when Hitler come and kill millions and millions of people in such a horrible way, that's not normal according to any standards of life. So, Rabotai, therefore, we hate him much more than we hate the others. Now comes the answer. As a result of this way of thinking that all of us has, almost every judgment we passed on people is wrong. Because Hashem told us to be judgmental, but He told us how to judge and how to value people. And if you do not know the guidelines, who is considered positive and who is negative, who is a big criminal and who is a small criminal, who is a big tzaddik and who is a small tzaddik, and what cause of donation is higher than other donation, you don't know all the values, then your head is a, is a salad. Greek salad, Israeli salad, but it's a salad. That's why you would look at a gay, now there's nothing wrong with that, but you would look at a murderer that is a monster, which both of them are equal criminals in the eyes of God. And both of them have execution by stoning and a permanent cut for their soul. Why one you despite and the other you don't? Because they brainwash you and you finally surrender to their garbage. You forgot what Hashem said. Or you know what Hashem said, but you are a product of the University of Manhattan. And over there you lived with this kind of people and all day you were around it. And in the end, and in the end, this is what you get, you see, in the University of Manhattan. That was a taste of what's going on over there. In the end, you admire some gay professor from New York more than you admire the Rambam. When that professor cannot be the dirt of the nail that Rambam had in his toe. You know the dirt that sometimes you gotta clean with the toothpick? What's over there, Kvodarav, what are you doing? I'm cleaning the dirt from my nail. That, that little drop of dirt on the, on, the, on the floor, that professor did not reach that level. I'm not exaggerating. He would die in the next world to be the dirt of the nail of the Rambam. He would die for it. Let me be the dirt of the Rambam and be with him in heaven. Under his nail. <laughs> but right now, we got confused. I gave today a lecture to the Syrian ladies here at 3 o'clock. There's a place they call the well. The well. They gather together. Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And one uh, woman, she said, educated. This word always trigger red light by me. <laughs> and I hear the word educated. I say to her, this word is a problematic word. She looks at me like she doesn't know what I'm, what I'm about to say. I say to her, you know, there is two kinds of educated. One is fantastic education, the education of the creator of the world, which is fully 100% the truth. And then there is secular educated, which is 99% garbage. Everything is the opposite of Hashem. We came from the monkeys, the world is billions of years old. It's stupid to learn Torah, it's primitive, it's not productive. Their God is science, even though they don't know one percent of science. Most of the science you hear, by the way, and you admire, it's all speculative science, which basically means zero. It's nothing. It's just an, a movie in Hollywood. It's fiction. By the end of the movie, you're back to where you are. The movie didn't add anything to your life. It's all fiction. It never happened. Same thing, speculative science. It's all projecting. 
this, there could have been this, and this came out of this, and <laughs> billions of years later that moved to here, you know. And I look at it like it's Mamash Moshe Rabbeinu brought it on the Ten Commandments. Why this admiring so, so many speculations? Do you know, by the way, when they ask you, submit a business plan. When you're looking for an investor for your business, right? You have an interesting idea. You want to develop your office. So you, know, you want some billionaire to invest money in your business. So you make a business plan. A part of the business plan is projection. How much you anticipate to make after one year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. So the guy is writing. After one year, we will hope to sell more than a million dollars in sales. But our expenses will be still two million dollars a year. Because of advertisement, he has a whole budget, how much he wants to milk that rich man from. So he's building. Second year, we will already cover our expenses, but we will not be profitable. We will have two million years expenses and two million years income. By the third year, we already estimate to have $5 million in income and $3 million in expenses. So we finally be profitable. So after five years, you get your investment back in full, plus you will be making a very nice income. Beautiful plan. That's nothing, that's dust in the wind. It's just a guess. It's a guess. Like I have to guess if Bitcoin will be next year 80,000 or 10,000. Whatever I say, it's logical. <laughs> it can be 80, it can be 10. Nobody in the world knows. One expert told me on Sunday, as of tomorrow, expect Bitcoin to skyrocket. In the next two weeks, it will cross 100,000 per one Bitcoin. Today went down $3,000. <laughs> I say, you know what, let me call that guy. I called him up. First time, didn't answer. He probably saw it coming. Second time, he didn't answer. He didn't answer the text. He didn't answer the WhatsApp. But I was persistent. Mm -hmm. Finally, he picked up. Around six something, he picked up. What happened to your projection? It looks like it's going the other way around. Don't catch me by the word. I didn't mean in one day. You still have time. In the end, it's all baloney. It's all baloney. So, all this speculative science in the end is all speculations. Did it happen? It didn't happen. Maybe, maybe not. But some of the speculations are so ridiculous that there is zero chance that it ever happened. Zero chance. You have to be a super moron to believe that something like this could have happened. Like, for instance, there were millions of explosions, random explosions, until one succeeded. <laughs> and a cell was created. You know, if you look at a cell in a microscope, a cell is more sophisticated than New York City. One cell. Cell. You have billions of cells. You know the, 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 the divinity in it, the plan, the brilliance in one cell, the chance that something like this will happen from millions of explosions doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. I'll give you an example. If I give you 100 coins right now, and I tell you to throw them on the floor, and you have to repeat the same exact way like the first time, First time you throw one coin here, one there, one there, the quarter is here, the penny is there, the dime is there. Right? There's a hundred coins in a room. Now I say I'm giving you one million attempts to throw the hundred coins that they will fall exactly like the first time. That the quarter will be exactly here and the dime exactly here and this is exactly here. What are the chances that it will happen? Any one of you will try to throw the coins? No. Why not? Because it's never going to happen. That's, by the way, have a bigger chance to happen than that the world was created by all this random of explosion. And on top of that, where is the debris of all the millions of explosions that were before? 
they had to leave some kind of a debris. You know, when you have an explosion, you see all kinds of debris. Where is it? It doesn't exist because it never happened. But how the people are so dumb to buy books and to be tested on such nonsense in university? Because 99% of what the people do in the world is stupid. Extremely stupid. They don't stop to think. You would think that doctors and detectives, at least they will not be stupid. You cannot be, you cannot be a good detective if you're a stupid person. You cannot be a stupid doctor. If you became a doctor, you have to be brilliant in some way, no? But doctors that see such divine miracles in a body every second, when they open it up, and they see how it was designed in such a way, and they still say, I don't believe there is a God, something here doesn't make any sense. A detective, he, know, he understands one thing from another. He knows from a little thing to find out who's the murderer. It's very, very interesting, brilliant. It's also experience, it's intuition. It's unbelievable work to be a good detective. But to be a good detective and not to look at the world and to come to the conclusion that there is an unbelievable creator, something is off here. Stupid people don't understand anything from their life. Okay, they don't understand any, anything. But you are a clever detective. How can you say in the same time that you just solved an unbelievable mystery with your brilliance, at the same time you say, I don't believe there is a creator to the world. If a detective would say, I don't believe that this can was made by anyone. I just think there was an explosion somewhere in New York and a can came out. This detective, you would hire him? You want him to, to investigate a big mystery in your family. After you heard him in a YouTube video say that he walked by the street in Coney Island, <laughs> there was an explosion, and the pink came, came out with a strawberry on it, and lemon, and, and all of that happened, and all these little letters, and the cover, and everything, and the stamp here. It was all a bunch of explosions until a can came out. What would you say? Cancel the contract with this idiot right away. Right or wrong? You want him to be the detective in your case? You want him to be the lawyer who defend you in court? No. But you are worse than him. Because when you went to university, you clapped to the stupid professor who just told you this garbage for four years. And you even bought his book and you asked for an autograph. And you made a selfie with this idiot. Do you understand why people don't think? Robots. Let's just do it. Why? Everyone does it. People now walk naked on the street with no shame, like animals. So she also wants to do it. Why would you like to walk like an animal with no clothes on the street? You are a human being, you're not an animal. Everyone does it. Do you know how many people moved in one year to Colorado? To Denver, Colorado? About 10 years ago? How many? One million new residents were added to Denver, Colorado in one year. How do I know? I went there to give a lecture. The guy is driving me from the airport. I see a lot of new constructions everywhere. Lots of new construction. I ask him, wow, I see they're building a lot of places here. So you know why? One million people moved here. So I say to him, why? He said, because they legalize grass. <laughs> that was, I think, one of the first places that drugs became legal. You can smoke all day grass in the street and they don't arrest you. So because people are so addicted to this garbage, they're willing to take their family, to move their children out of school, to lose their job, to lose their business and to move to a different state just that they can be like monkeys spreading smoke in the street. Why? Because they have nothing else in their life. Their head is empty. Conclusion, Rabotai, and we finish here. <coughs> this expression that Chazal told us in Gemara is not just a, an exaggeration. 
is not just something to think about, it's halacha lemaase. And the halacha is gadol amachtio yoter min haorgo. And the conclusion for that is A. You will never ever in your life ever offer a job to someone that sits and learns Torah in yeshiva. Never. If you have a nephew or cousin or brother-in-law, he sits full day and learns Torah and he suffers financially. And you can use someone like him in your business. He's very clever, he's honest, he's a tzaddik. He's probably going to be a very hard-working worker. So you say, you know what? He's looking for parnasa. I'm looking for a good worker. Why don't you come work for me? In one or two years, you'll be very rich. I'll have you, you'll have a car, we'll list your car, you do this, we'll help you with this, we'll help you with that. You convince him to leave the yeshiva and come to work for you, there's right there a 50% chance that in five years from now, it will be completely secular. Statistic does not lie. Someone that was learning full-time Torah and left, starting to go down, lower, 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 until you meet him a year later in a wedding with pink shoes <laughs> and a pink bow tie and hair full of oil. A year ago, he was mamash tzaddik in yeshiva. I have to see how he done in Shemona how connected he was to Hashem. You look at him now, you're not sure if he's Jewish or not. A year later, Forget about a year later. Now comes Pesach. Today Ben Azmanim started. You know what Ben Azmanim means? The yeshivot goes off from Rosh Chodesh Nisan until after Pesach. What happened? Some of the boys, their families in Brooklyn, Queens, they go to their family. Right? They're not in yeshiva. Some stays in yeshiva, they learn half a day. Okay. But some, they go back to the family. They walk here in the streets of Kings Highway, Ocean Parkway, I don't know, Kings Plaza. Give them three weeks. And go and see how they became in three weeks. Three weeks walking in the streets of Brooklyn, 50% minimum of their spiritual level was gone in three weeks. They don't have desire to go to pray in the shul. They don't put the hat anymore. They go down. Why? As soon as you leave the Torah, boom! It's a shock. You decline right away in your spiritual level. It's written, Im ta'azveni yom, yomayim ezveka. You would leave me for one day. You go one day without learning Torah. You will feel my absence in your life for at least two days. <laughs> it's so true. And even the people that, uh, that left the yeshiva, 10 years later that they're already 80% secular now, some of them still do not see what happened to them. Some already realize that they are finished. They were here and now they're in the banem of the banem. But some still live in denial. But I'm the same like I was. Yeah, maybe I learn less, but I still keep Shabbat. I still eat strictly kosher. My kids are in yeshivot. My wife go to the mikveh. He chose five, six things that he still keep. But the 500 things that he doesn't keep anymore, he doesn't mention. Why? He wants to prove that he did not decline. So this is what I'm telling you. You offer a job to someone that is in Torah, is a Ben Torah, you're jeopardizing your life of eternity. Your life of eternity. His life of eternity you're jeopardizing, but you're also jeopardizing your life of eternity. Now what happens if he would not decline? He will not become secular. He would still learn a lot of Torah. He would still remain very religious. Still daven in Minyan, you will still get a huge punishment. Why? How could you have taken such a risk? That could have been a genocide. This could have been a genocide. Taking one tzaddik out of the yeshiva and making mechalel Shabbat after a year or two, because you got him out, you gave him a nice job, he makes good money, he drives in BMW, he lives in, live in some kind of a movie. 
slowly, slowly forgot about Hashem. Then his children, what kind of yeshiva is going to put them? I don't have to tell you how it's going to look. And a generation later, all his grandkids will all be chilonim, all of them. And then after a hundred years, there's going to be 30,000 haters of Hashem that cannot stand religion, that sit in the Israeli government thinking how to destroy the yeshivot. This could have come from one act like this, taking a boy out of yeshiva, that's it. A hundred years later, this is what happened. I would finish with a story. There was one time a Haver Knesset in Israel, his name was Shmuel Tamir. Shmuel Tamir. He was a member of the Knesset. If I remember, he was from the Ma'arach, from the lefties. Shmuel Tamir wanted to make abortions in Israel legal unconditionally at any given moment, first month, fifth month, ninth month. And he, you know, in order for you to pass a law in a Knesset, you start with committees. There's rooms, you start building it, people argue, eventually you finalize the law, and you bring it for a vote. If it passed first time, it needs to pass second and third times. Thing can happen until the second or third, it can, it can get cancelled. Once it passed, that becomes the official law. They fix the laws. They always pass laws. Shmuel Tamir wants to make abortions in Israel. I'm talking to you more than 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. This story in the Knesset. He's about to pass this law for abortion, to make it legal in, uh, in every hospital. You don't have to go to private clinic. In hospitals, with the payment that the government sponsor, women can come and abort the babies at any minute, a day before delivery. That's what he wanted to do. One religious man in the Knesset, if I remember correctly, name was Porush, very religious. He came and whispered in his ears, he said many years ago, 50 years ago, one woman wanted to abort her baby. And my father was begging her day and night not to abort the baby. Promised her money, promised her support. No matter what she said, he fought her to the end until the baby was born. And the life of this innocent baby just got saved thanks to my father. Do you know who was this baby? You. You. <laughs> he told him you. He looked at him. This lefty Rasha. Ah, come on. Call your mother. Ask him. He got shocked. This rabbi speaks with such confidence. Yesh dvarim bego. Those days he didn't have cell phone. He had to run to the pay phone and call. Call up his mother. He never heard the story. No mother comes to tell her child, by the way, you were born because they put a gun to my head. I didn't really want you. I wanted to chop you to pieces and vacuum you and sell you to China that the Chinese will eat you up. She doesn't want him to know about it. So he called up his mother, and the mother said, it's true, it was him, it was his father. He came back into the Knesset and said, I would like to cancel this law that I'm about to pass. And they canceled the law. That was, the law was already passing, they had a majority. Now I want to see how clever you are. What do you learn from this story about humankind in general? Hashem uses the wicked to bring you salvation. Hashem uses the wicked to bring you better salvation. Why? Here the righteous was used to bring salvation. His father was a tzaddik. He convinced the mother not to abort. <laughs> Thanks to that, this law was cancelled. 
if his father would not fight with this secular woman not to abort the baby, they will pass that day the law to make it legal. So who prevented it? The father of Porush. You get the point? The salvation came from a religious man. He didn't know that what he does right now to save one Jewish baby, what consequences he will have 50 years later. Megalgelim schut lide zakai. Hashem would show him in the next world, thanks to you, another 20,000 babies are not being murdered every year. Because you put effort in this, in this woman, or maybe gave her money, I don't know what was the case there. Look of what you've done, already by now save maybe two, three hundred thousand babies from then until today. And every Rosh Hashanah, Hashem shows his father how many abortions are prevented thanks to the efforts that he put in that woman. Because later on, that's what led to cancel the law. By the way, don't be too happy. They still killed more than two million babies in Israel in abortion since Israel became a state. They killed thousands of babies every year, many thousands. But here it will be more because it will be very easy to abort. Just come to the hospital and do it, free. Now they have to get the money, they have to go to a private clinic. If they want to do it through the hospital, they have to go through a committee. They always approve the committee. They're all a bunch of secular communists. They don't care. They're Democrats. They're pro-abortion. A woman has the right on her body. What does it have to do with a woman's body? It's the life of someone else that is now inside her body. If now a woman would swallow my diamond ring, she just stole from me a diamond ring worth a million dollars and swallow it. Hey, police, here, look. This is what she did. She has the right on her body. We have no permission to penetrate, you know, inside and cut it and bring out the diamond. She owns her own body. What kind of a stupid answer is this? There's a life of someone inside. You're allowed to murder him because it's inconvenient for her. Next time she should think what she does. Before, sad reality. Very good. People can care less about the truth if it can predict their own pleasure and their own will. So he is very anti, you know, to cancel the freedom from people that wants to abort. He's a pro-abortion activist. Once it became connected to him. And he understand that if his law would have passed before, his mother would not be able to do whatever it's affecting right now me. I came to the world thanks to this religious man who fought to prevent abortions. So how can I go to promote something that that something would have killed me? Ah, now when I'm Nagua Badavar, I look at the entire sugiya completely different. Same thing if it's your own son. A judge wants to pass the law. Anyone who will drive uh, faster than 80 miles an hour, they pound this car for 60 days. Some places they do it. 30 days, 60 days. Come back in 60 days, you have to pay storage. <laughs> So the judge passed the law, and the next day his son was driving 85. Dad, I, they just took away your car. <laughs> son drives his Mercedes. What do you mean they took my car? I drove 85 on the LIE. Who did it? The policeman. He's right here. Let me talk to him. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm Judge Greenberg. Yes, how can I help you, judge? Do you know what you're about to do? It's my car you're pounding there. If I remember correctly, you're the one who passed the law a week ago, no? 
No, you didn't understand. I didn't mean for cases like this. <laughs> but if it would be the son of the some stranger, and he will call the judge, hey, because of you, they're about to take my car. Shame on you. How do you have the nerve to even call me? That's the right thing to do. If it was up to me, I would give you an extra fine. Ah, because it's not his son. He get the point or not? That's called Nagua Badavar. Nagua Badavar. If you want to check your mezuzah, you're going to go to the sofer that wrote it? <coughs> if you're stupid, yes. <laughs> what he was going to tell you? Oh, I'm so sorry, I sold you a non-kosher mezuzah for 10 years. All your problems in life is in your mezuzah because of me. No, that, eh, that's nothing. That's it's perfectly fine. Oh, oh my God, what have I done? I'm not going to tell him he's embarrassed. So you got to take it to someone else. Mezuzot is life and death. It's no joke. Tefillin, mezuzot. Ha'olam omed al zeh, degmar ha'asim. A person can suffer 20 years nightmare in his life for one non-kosher mezuzah in his own. No joke. One day he takes the mezuzah out, he checks it out. Get the shock of his life. One word is missing or one letter is missing. One letter is missing, it can mess up your entire life. The life of your child. Even uh, what mezuzah will arrive to your hand or what filin will arrive to your hand is also a decision of Hashem. I'll give you an explanation. If a person is cheap, he doesn't want to buy good filin. He wants to buy garbage, the cheapest. A beginner, basically, first filin he writes. It looks like a caricatura. And... Uh, because it's like that, when it comes to his cars and his suits and his watches, he buys top of the line. It's not so cheap. But when it comes to tefillin and mezuzot and everything is looking for the cheapest. Why? Because religion is nothing for him. It's not important. Eh, Rabbi, Rabbi. Tfil, it's tefillin. Rabbi, it's kosher. So what do I care if it's 700 or if it's 2,000? Both of them are kosher, yeah, but you know, you have a Toyota Corolla and you have a Rolls Royce. Both of them are cars. So would you agree to drive this car? No, you don't want to change your Rolls Royce, right? Why? Because you understand the difference. Handmade, top of the line, 300,000. This one, machine made, garbage, made in China, made in Taiwan, I don't know where. You drive it, made in Korea. You see after a year or two the differences. And it's kosher. It's questionable. One guy came to Raviliashi 40 years ago. He paid for his tefillin $1,500. Supposed to be the best tefillin at that time, 40 years ago. And then after a while he checked it and there was a question about his tefillin. So he came to Raviliashi to ask. Rav Eliashiv looked at that, he said to him, it's kasher bedi'eved. Now when it already happened, it's kosher. But lechatkhila, to begin with, it should have not been in the market. There, are, there is such a thing, kasher lechatkhila or kasher bedi'eved. So, ah, oh, okay, so baruch Hashem, very good. He's about to leave the room. And Rav Eliashiv scream, it's kasher bedi'eved. Every day you will put filin that is kosher barely after the fact. Where is your irat shamayim? You're willing to come to shamayim and stand in front of Hashem and say to him, how did you not, how are you not afraid about your filin level? The rabbi says, Barely kosher, eventually it's kosher. After the fact, okay, let it go. That's what it means, bediyevet, let it go. Okay, no, no, you go in. So, someone like that, 
that is cheap, then Hashem will be very, very strict with him. Because it's not cheap for other things. If it's cheap for everything, tov, it's his nature. Also going to get his punishment. But someone that is generous in everything, you go to a restaurant and spend a thousand dollars on a dinner, no problem, tip, this, waitress, this goya, he gives her a hundred bucks because she smiled to him. Here, another hundred bucks to the tip. Big shot. Everywhere he go, spends money, comes to fill in, I'll take this. It's not the cheapest, it's the second cheapest in the list, Rabbi. Someone like that, Hashem is very angry at him. Meaning the restaurant is more important than me. More important than the covenant that I made with you, which is tefillin. Shame on you, big time. But what happened if someone went to the best sofer, got the best from the best sofer, and got the best batim of tefillin? And they already made a, a thousand pairs handmade, a thousand pairs, and one had a problem. One, people are people. People are not God. They check again and again and again. The chance that it will be not kosher is very, very small, almost not exist. But let's say after 10,000 pairs they made, one had a question. It was questionable. Wow, over here we missed something. From the 10,000 pairs that this sofer wrote in his lifetime, <coughs> that one that was not perfect came to you. Coincidence or decision from Hashem? 100% Hashem. You won't be punished because you, got, you went for the best feeling. You went for the best sofer for someone that is trustworthy, that got you this feeling. It's all handmade, beautiful. Everything's fine. You didn't argue about the price. You were willing to pay whatever it is. So nobody can blame you for not trying to get the best. On that part, you get a V. So why in the end you got the only one that was questionable? You have to check yourself out. No coincidence. From all the people, it came to you. You know when the Klosenburg Rebbe came from the Holocaust? to New York on a boat, there were 400 guys there. They have only one shirt, nothing else in their life. They lost everything they had. They're coming to America as refugees, hoping to start a new life. The Klosenberg Rebbe had one more pair of tzitzit. He took it out. He said, I want to give one of you another pair of tzitzit. I have one, none of you have. I want to make a lottery. One of you will win the tzitzit. We'll write numbers from one to four hundred, put it in a jar, everyone will have number in his hand, the other half of the page will be in a, in a jar. We mix it, we'll pull out one, the number that will come, the regular lottery. One guy was a wise guy, what did he do? He has a white shirt, he jumped and ripped the shirt from the side, and ripped the other shirt. Now the shirt has four corners. It needs the stripe, the tzitzit. So Rabbi, now I am obligated to have tzitzit. Because I have four corners and I don't have the strings. You gotta give it to me. I have to put it in my, in my shirt. They are not obligated because they don't have a shirt that is four corners. They, if they get the tzitzit, they get every second a mitzvah. But if they don't get the tzitzit, they, go, they don't get punished. They just lose the mitzvah. Because they don't have four corners right now. But I am getting punished if I don't have the, the tzitziot. So the rabbi told him, you're right. Very clever what you did. But before you did what you did, before you became obligated, I already became obligated to keep my promise. The Torah said, Motzas fatecha tishmor. You must keep what comes out of your mouth. So since I promised to do a lottery and I already gave the notes, the, the numbers to people, we will have to go with the plan. But I am sure if you are so devoted and so much L'Shem Shamaim, you so much for the sake of Hashem, that you're willing to rip your only shirt 
that you should get a tzitzit. So important for you, this mitzvah. I'm sure your number will come out. One out of 400 in percentage. How much is that? A quarter of a percent chance. 99.75% chance that your number will not come out. Which number came out? His number. Famous story. Which number came out? His number. Why? Bederech she'adam rotze lilech molichim oto. You choose where you want to walk. And from there Hashem will help you. You want to go rob a bank? Who gives you oxygen to do it? You die in the middle, okay? you get a heart attack. Who keeps your body functioning while you're robbing a bank? Who keeps your body functioning while you're convincing a Bachur Yeshiva to leave the Yeshiva and come to work, to work in real estate? Who helps you when you beat up your wife? Who gives you the strength to give the punches in the most painful places to break her nose or to make her bleed or to make her die? Who moved you? Without Hashem, you couldn't move a second. So what, Hashem is cooperating with the crime? He sees they're about to murder the woman. Why does he give you the strength? He can give you a heart attack and you die. The nature of the world is the nature of the world. I didn't make nature to interfere with that every minute. This guy wants to eat pork, okay, I'll make him paralyzed. This guy wants to steal, okay, I'll make him blind. This one wants to beat up his wife, I'll chop his hand off. It doesn't work that way. Olam keminago noeg, and every criminal will receive the payments that he deserves, for good or for bad. Reward or punishment. In the end, everyone will be judged. The question is, what happens if I choose to hurt another Jew? And he's not guilty of anything. Tzaddik. Tzaddik. He left something valuable here. I took it and disappeared. That's it. He came back. Wow. Where is my wallet? We didn't see. It's against the Torah and I'm allowed to steal. I have to, the opposite, you have to run and return the lost object. How did Hashem allow you to hurt such a tzaddik? He's not guilty. He never stole. He never charged interest. He never caused the financial damage to anyone. He believes all the parnasites from Hashem. How in the world you got permission to hurt such an innocent, righteous person? You hear the question or no? If he's a thief, and in Rosh Hashanah Hashem decided that he has to lose 80% of what he stole, because it's more than the budget that Hashem wants to give him this year. So now, now Hashem sends all the thieves to him. One minute his engine of the car blow up, the next day someone robbed him, until in the end everything he stole will be clean from him. But if he didn't steal, if he didn't cause any damage, why would he lose money? Because Reuven chose to steal from him his wallet, now he's gonna lose $500? Does he deserve to lose 500? No, he doesn't. It's perfect, clean hands. Doesn't have any penny that he stole. Very, very careful. So why, why someone robbed him? The answer is, if someone robbed you, is that a clear indication that you're guilty of financial damage or no? Meaning if you're clean and you don't deserve to lose money, no one would have permission to rob you? True or false? Because you Gilgul from before. But even in Gilgul from before, you're guilty of something. Yeah. The question is, I'm talking someone who did not steal at all. Not in this life, not in his past life. Someone decided to steal his money from his coat. It's hanging there. If the person never ever stole and he doesn't deserve to lose money, the thief can succeed in his plan or Hashem will cancel the plan? If you say that Hashem will cancel the plan, that means there's no free will. Sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. It will replace it. Hashem will replace it. Replace it. Meaning he stole the 500, two days later he get it somewhere else. 
What did Hashem gain by that? Wasn't it easier just to make the person distracted? Police pass by, the light went off, something like that. And he get distracted. In the meantime, the tzaddik left, and in the end, he stole from someone else. Right? Hashem could have done it in a natural way. Now, no one will know it's Hashem. It looks like nature. And the tzaddik just got saved. So sometimes Hashem does it like that. And sometimes he let the crook steal and he compensated the tzaddik from a different direction. The question is why? Why sometimes Hashem will protect you not to get damaged? Or sometimes he will let you get damaged but will reimburse you? Yes. Oh, the answer to this is in the Gemara. Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan were Chevruta. Rabbi Yochanan, one day he walked on the street and got robbed. He comes to the Shiva, he's, Chevruta is a former gans, gangster who became religious. He became a big rabbi now. He asked him, what happened today you cannot focus? He said to him, I just got mugged. He said, who would dare to mess with my Chevruta? Don't they know who I am? I'm Shimon ben Lakish, the former head of the mafia. He said to him, let me go get you back your wallet. He went to the street, started to ask around. Everyone was still afraid of him. <laughs> Calm down, don't alter <laughs> talk. He said, you have half an hour to return the wallet to the rabbi, or I'm going to get into action here and you regret the moment you were born. No problem. Consider it done. <laughs> 20 minutes later, someone brought him back the wallet. He checked, all the money was there. Now he was able to learn. Why did Mara bring us such a story? Every story is teaching you a message for life. What's the message over here? There are two ways to look at the story. One negative and one positive. The negative is a mistake because the Gemara won't bring a negative example. It has to be something positive. Let's start with the negative. The negative is, how can it be that such a rabbi, that ten of his sons died, the Gemara say, one son after the other was dead, and the last one that died took a bone or a tooth from his body and was going from house to house of people who sit Shiva to comfort them. You lost one, I lost ten. And he stayed normal. And he, fa and he focused as usual, and he was able to learn Torah. And now somebody stole his wallet with two, three hundred dollars and he cannot learn Torah? Shame on you. What kind of a, of a tzaddik you are? When your children are dying, it didn't break you. You're learning Torah like, like every day. Now someone stole two, three hundred dollars for you, you cannot focus? The money is more important than your children? That's a negative way. Even if you say that he wasn't the one that lost 10 kids, forget about that. Just a regular tzaddik. Someone steal from you $200. You're upset. Once you enter the yeshiva and you open the gemara and you start learning five minutes, do you know anyone that would remember the wallet while he's learning gemara? No one will remember it. You would learn for three hours, 1, 1 p.m. came, you close the Gemara, oh, my wallet is not here. You remember what happened in the morning. But while you were learning, the last thing you care about is the wallet. You agree or no? So what, we are better than Rabbi Yochanan? The answer is, if we get robbed, we cry over the money we lost, not over the cause that got us to lose the wallet. We are not panicked because we're probably guilty of stealing or charging interest from a Jew or causing a financial to another Jew or causing someone to lose money. As results of that, we are being punished that someone robbed our own wallet with a few hundred dollars. Because if we lose money, that means we have money that is not ours in our position. <coughs> when someone robbed you, the last problem you should think about is that the money you lost right now. That not, should not even bother you. The only thing that should bother you is why? Why I'm losing this money? What have I done wrong to deserve it? Because any surim below Avon, 
There is no suffering without this prior sin that caused it. If Hashem sent me someone to steal money from me, that means I myself is a thief. Mida keneged mida. All the punishments are measure for measure. So Rabbi Yochanan could not learn because he was thinking, what have I done to deserve it? Did I steal? Did I not pay one of the workers? Do I owe money to someone? What, what have I done? Where did I do something that caused someone a financial damage? You cannot find. You cannot focus on the Gemara right now. It's an emergency now. I'm guilty of stealing. Someone just stole from me my wallet. I am Rabbi Yochanan, probably took money that is not mine. He cannot focus on the learning. I'm sure he would not sleep for days, breaking his head to find out what did he do wrong, that he can go fix it. When Rish Lakish gave him back the wallet and everything was there, he was happy. Why? It was only a test. I'm not really guilty. Ah, Baruch Hashem. It was false alarm. That's what he said. Sometimes Hashem wants to take advantage on a thief that wants to steal from a tzaddik. Not because the tzaddik is guilty. It's clean. Doesn't deserve to lose a penny. But his emuna level, his faith in Hashem is not to the maximum level yet. He knows everything is from Hashem, Parnassah is from Hashem. Of course, he will never steal to make an extra income. No. But... Is worry. Will I have to pay the mortgage in two weeks? Will I be able to pay tuition next month when the bill comes? Will I be able to afford a wedding ring when they offer me a shiduch? He has this concern all the time. That's lack of emuna. You don't trust me that I'll take care of you like I take care of the bugs and the elephants and the mouse? You are less than them? Why would you always worry that I neglect you? So what do Hashem do? He tests him. It's a test in Emuna. Later, by the way, many times you get a test in Emuna, like they're offering you a job. The job is not kosher, but it, it has a big salary, and you are broke. You need the money. But Friday, you will get home a minute before Shabbat. You won't even have time to shower. You cannot prepare for Shabbat. You have to lie in a business to customers. You know, one of those jobs. But you're so desperate, you need money. And they say, you have to give us an answer by the end of the day. Because there are two other people who want the job. You fight with your Yetzirara, and you say, I'm sorry, I cannot take the job. Why? You say you're broke, you need the job. Yeah, but there are things in this job that jeopardize my soul. I cannot do it. What happened a month later? You find a job ten times better. This was all a test. If you take the job, you stick with this job and lose your Olam Ava. You pass the test and you didn't take the job, there was already a job waiting for you for a month later. There was a job already waiting for you. It's yours. Only if you will not fail in the test. If you fail in the first test, okay, so you're not going to get the good job, you're going to get that non-kosher job. I've saw it hundreds of times over the years. Hundreds of times. Why? That Hashem gives a person a big temptation. Big temptation. Some Goya who had a questionable conversion, still not modest. Barely, if she keeps Shabbat Bechlal. Walking, I don't want to tell you how she walks in the street. And he's dying to marry her. Ah, oh, I've got such a pretty wife. The rabbi tell him, let go. They will destroy you. Every one of your kids will be 50% Jewish, 50% Goy. You will never know. You may find out when you come in front of Hashem that you have no kids. You've been married to a non-Jewish woman and committed million sins in the next 40 years. And anyway, her beauty will excite you for a few months. After that, you're not going to walk, I'm lucky, I have such a pretty wife. Nobody walks in the street thinking, I'm lucky I am. In the beginning, he's lucky, because he's excited. Once he got used to the beauty, that's it. 
When you buy the best car in the world, how long are you excited? A month, two months? After a year that you get into your Mercedes, you're dancing like the first day? First day you walk three times in the middle of the night to the driveway to smell the leather. What are you doing? Where do you have besamim? For me it's besamim. I love the smell of the new Mercedes. Three months later, ah, the German is not what it used to be. Ah, it's not so great like they say. Well, got used to it. The car is the same car. Nothing changed in three months. He just got used to it. You get the point, no? So, any questions before we finish? Yes. Yeah. Um, what if by the wedding, they're not religious in terms of mixed wedding, but you know they're going to keep Tarat Mishpacha? If they keep Tarat Mishpacha, so we're still not allowed to go to the wedding because the actual wedding is not kosher. The question you should have asked, are you allowed to set two chilonim on a date? <coughs> Knowing they're not going to keep tarat mishpacha. The answer is you're not allowed. You're not allowed. What happens if you know they will keep tarat mishpacha? The girl told you, when I get married, I'll keep tarat mishpacha. I want pure kids. I don't want problem. But you know they won't keep Shabbat because his business open on Shabbat, and she works also on Shabbat. They both work on Shabbat. Now you can set up Itzik and Lily. <laughs> Itzik and Lily bought Mechalele Shabbat. But Lily promised, she made a neder, she will keep Taharat Mishpacha. You get the point or no? If she didn't keep Tarat Mishpacha, you're not allowed to set her up with anyone. They'll commit sins of karet every time they're together. You don't want it on your head. I am the matchmaker of those sins. But since now there is no sins of Tarat Mishpacha, there is going to be a sin of Hilul Shabbat. You're allowed to set up two Mechalelei Shabbat to meet each other or no? What will be worse than what it already is? Is Mechalel Shabbat in his apartment? And is Mechalel Shabbat in her apartment? Now they're going to be in one apartment, Mechalel Shabbat together. Maybe there will be Mechalel Shabbat less, because now they have to light two lights. In his living room here, and in her living room there. Now they're going to be in one living room, so there's only one time turning the light on. So maybe they would actually lower the amount of Chilulei Shabbat. You get the point or no? So, the rule is like this. If two secular people can only commit a sin together, they need to be, a man and a woman needs to be together in order for them to practice that sin, you're not allowed to bring them together. At the same time, if you have two secular husband and wife, and the husband went to jail, got arrested, and you can go and release him on bail, your cousin, let's say, you're not allowed to release him. Even though to release a prisoner is a huge mitzvah, pidyon shvuim, you're not allowed to release him, because when you release him, he's going to go and be intimate with his wife, and both of them will do his karet tonight. It's 5 p.m. If you keep him another night in prison, prison, there will be one less karet for him and one less karet for her. If you keep him a week, there will be maybe three or four less karet for each one of them. You're helping them by keeping him in jail. Because they are separate right now, they cannot commit a, a huge crime against Hashem. That has a huge punishment as well. So you feel bad for the guy, after all he's in jail. So there is a way. You come to him and say, look, I'm not allowed to release you. Because you're not Shomer Nida. And I go back, you're going to be with your wife, and she's not in, she didn't go to the mikveh. So if you accept on yourself, you swear to me, that if I bail you out now, you keep Tarat Mishpacha from now on, you never touch your wife until she comes back from the mikveh when, the, when she's pure, then I release you. If you don't accept it on yourself, 
then I cannot release you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to ruin my life to save your life. The answer would be, depends how he likes the jail. <laughs> if he will have some monsters over there looking at him and planning a party for him tonight, I'll sign anything you want. I swear? Yeah, yeah, I promise. I give him my word. So, you release him. If he cheat and lied and he in the end broke his promise, it's not on you. But there is a chance that he's going to keep his word. Some secular people, when they make such a promise, a serious one, they stick to it. You know the story of the guy that the, uh, one rabbi gave him a ride. Chiloni, chayal, soldier. And uh, he was an anti-religion soldier, and the rabbi started to talk to him, and he started to see that the religion, after all, is very interesting. So he said to him, how can I pay you back? You're such a nice man, you're Haredi, I always thought negative about the Haredim. He said, you don't need to, do, to give me anything. Just accept on yourself to do one small mitzvah. One small mitzvah a day. Something that you would not feel bad about doing it. He said to him, give me, give me a small mitzvah. He said, you know, in the morning when you tie your shoes, you first put the right shoe, then you put the, the left shoe, then you tie the left shoe, and then you tie the right shoe. That's the order. First, you put your right leg into the shoe. Then the left leg. Then you tie the left, then you tie the right. That's all. So that's nothing. All I have to do is to do it in this order? Okay, no problem, I promise. And he was in the army. One time they told him, you have to get on a helicopter. Quickly, you have three minutes. In the morning, they woke them up quickly. They all put their shoes on, this. The helicopter is waiting. All the soldiers are running. A huge helicopter. Seventy soldiers are going on the helicopter. He's about to go on the helicopter. He said to the commander, oh, I'm sorry, my stomach. He didn't want to tell him that he didn't tie the shoes in the right way. <laughs> what is he going to do now? Untie the shoe and, and do it again and, and tie it again? What are you doing? We're in a rush. What are you playing with your shoelaces now? Get on a helicopter. I'm sorry, I have to run to the bathroom. It will take a minute. He went inside, untied the shoes, tied them again in the right order, came out, the helicopter took off. Don't mess with me. The guy screamed. They took off and they crashed and they all died. I remember that. That's a famous story. He's the only survivor from this tragedy. What saved him? The shoelaces. Accepted on himself to keep this. That was the test of his life. That Hashem wanted to know if he has values and he will keep his promise. No one is here to judge him. The religious man is far gone. It's between him and Hashem. Since he doesn't know what Shabbat is, and he doesn't know tefillin, doesn't know kosher food, doesn't know anything. What does he know between me and God? The shoelaces. That's his Torah. That's his entire Torah. Right now. In his level. And he kept stuck to his promise. Saved his life. You know the story of the girls that were in my seminar no? a few months ago, before October 7. Two or three weeks before October 7, they came to our seminar in Jerusalem. They accepted on themselves to keep Shabbat after I usually always give my Shabbat lecture in the end of the seminar, the last hour. I destroyed all the Mechalelei Shabbat over there. Some of them cry. They get the shock of their life. They never know what it means to be Mechalelei Shabbat. So we ask, who wants to accept on himself to be Shomer Shabbat? People raise their hand. So they put tzitziot. I'm sure you saw the videos. Tzitziot, they grab the books, they grab the USBs. It's an, a Mahmad Arsinai, Mamash. Two girls say we accept on ourselves to be Shomer Shabbat. And these two girls were registered to go to that festival. You know the party that they have? Thousands of people around Buddha on Simchat Torah. Thousands of people. So, what happened? 
they went to the party from Thursday. Why? Because they knew they have to keep Shabbat. So they would leave Friday. But they have a bunch of girls with them. Seven girls. Wow, the whole party starting tonight. It's the weekend. What do you mean you want to leave now? Friday. We, we didn't even get to the... We accepted on ourselves to keep Shabbat. Are you coming with us or no? The other girls had no choice. They all went with them. Maybe they have the car. They had to go back with them. They went to Be'er Sheva for Shabbat. And the next morning, they heard on the news that this party was all butchered and almost everyone dead or kidnapped or whatever happens there. So they would either die or being kidnapped and raped every minute until today for six months. So that seminar not only make Baalei Tshuva actually save the life of seven Jewish girls from being now in Gaza or being dead or being raped, one of the two. Think about it. If they would not stick to their promise, we accept on ourselves to keep Shabbat, the consequences would be beyond words. It's no joke. You accept something between you and Hashem and you don't keep it? If you only had a way to know what consequences it will have to your future, to your eternity, to the life of your children, you would faint. You would faint. One little thing you do, one person you insulted, one person that asked you for help and you ignored him. One person who called you five times and you ignored him and you didn't call him back. And then he killed himself, or who knows what. You never know until you go in front of Hashem and they show you the consequences of your action. It's written, Meshalem la'adam ki prima alalav. Person is being judged based on the fruits of his actions. Not his actions, fruits of his actions. What came out of what you did? What came out of your donation? What came out of your Lashon Ara? What came out of your hatred to the rabbis and to the religious people? What came out about you being a lawyer, a family lawyer, taking the kids out of the righteous father and giving it to the wicked mother who will move them to public school and destroy their souls? You know, what you have to deal with? You know how many religious lawyers will get the, the worst hell you can imagine? Religious, coming to shul to pray Mincha and Mayriv in Minyan. Shachri day in a shul, 7 a.m. The hell that they're going to have, even some of the secular people won't have. Family lawyer. How many times he was asked to, be re to represent one of the parents, and he, cho and he had to represent the wicked one. There's a righteous and a wicked. Let's say the father is a Baal Tshuva and the mother is not. So she wants to get divorced and take the four kids. She want to move them to public school. She want to marry a guy. She want to do all kinds of things that will destroy the kids. You, as a religious lawyer, have to defend her. You have to come to the court and you have to make the tzaddik look bad. And in the end, she gets custody. That's it. You lost your Olam Abba. You're not going to be able to tell Hashem, I need it, Parnassah. That's my job. Your job to take Jewish kids from yeshiva and move them to public school? For billion, trillion dollars, you're not allowed to do it. And if you tell her, I cannot represent you, she can sue you for discrimination. Why you don't represent me? Because you're a religious Jew and I'm not a religious Jew? She'll sue you in court. You would lose. Some liberal Bernie Sanders job judge will make you lose the case. Every little thing they can sue you today. Someone come to your office, you don't give him a job, you hate me because I'm Chinese. I have nothing against Chinese people. Yes, you do. He sues you. Now, the lawyer will cost you $75,000. Go prove you don't hate Chinese, or blacks, or Jews. To prove that you're not guilty, would cost you more than that when you are guilty. If you come and say, yes, yes, I'm guilty, let me pay a 
let's make a settlement, okay, let's make a plea bargain. I am guilty, I hate the Chinese, okay, fine, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry, it will never happen again. How much I have to pay, okay, pay $3,000, fine and go. If you want to prove that you're innocent, it will cost you $75,000. <laughs> Many times to come to court, have to bring witnesses, they have never heard you say anything against Oriental people. The system is so bad. You don't know, don't know what to do. You get the point or not? In Israel, there once had a commercial, and we finished with that. Bakvish, al tiye tzodek, tiye chacham. Translation: On the road, don't be right, be smart. You're right. You have the right to go first. He has a stop sign. But it's some drunk junkie come full speed to the stop line. He is not about to stop. I don't care, I have the right to go first. <laughs> go first and go to hell after that. <laughs> if you stop and you let him go, it's not justice. You were supposed to go first. What's better, to go first and to die or to let the crook go first and to stay alive? That's, by the way, what life is all about. And religion is also like that. Your wife is wrong and you are right. You have to be stupid to make her wrong. You have to know that she's always right. <laughs> they made a song in Israel. You want to know the song? But you have to sing with me. <laughs> you know what the song is? At Sodeket, At Sodeket, At Sodeket, 500 times. You are right, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> One guy came to Rav Enzion, <laughs> Shaul. He said, Rabbi, this guy did to me this and that inside. How can he do such a thing? What kind of a fool man does such a thing? That's Odek. You're right, he said to him. Then the other guy came in. He told him his side of the story. He said to him, That's Odek. You're right. So the wife of Rav Enzion came. She said, How can it be? He is right. And he's right. He said, Gamma at Sodeke. <laughs> You're also right. What do I care? Make you feel good. You're right. That's called be smart. Don't be right. Let your child be happy. You know, one uh, Rebbe in Yeshiva, he asked one of the students, where were you last night at 5 p.m. in a shiur? He disappeared. He said to him, Rabbi, I, I didn't feel good. I went to Kupat Cholim. Kupat Cholim is the local uh, medical center. So after, so he said, oh, I hope you now feel better. Yeah, yeah, today I'm good, Baruch Hashem, I'm, I'm healthy. When the shiur finished, one of the students came to the rabbi, rabbi, come on, you don't know that Kupat Cholim closed at 3 p.m.? <laughs> Everyone in Israel knows it. That's it, 3 p.m., they closed the medical center. The rabbi told him, what do you think? I didn't know that. When he told me that he was there at 5 p.m., but what is the alternative? I'll be right, I'll catch him in a lie, he will be so embarrassed from me that I call him lying, and will leave the yeshiva for good, and become a goy. So I pretend that I believe that he was in Kupat Cholim, and I tell him, oh, I, feel, I hope you feel better today. Baruch Hashem, next time if you don't feel good, let me know, I'll come visit you. <laughs> and he stays, and he comes today to the shiur, and one day he will stop with his lies and his absence. Don't be right, be smart. It's with raising children, it's with your marriage, it's in the business with your partner, it's with the authorities. Sometimes you are right, it costs you a million dollars to prove it, it will destroy you. Or take away all your energy. Five years in courts, back and forth, fighting, interviews, reporters. Just pay the fine and get it over with. And in a week, no one will remember it anyway. The struggle to prove that you're right will destroy your life and your family. Better just to pay. Okay, here, take the money and finish. I have a friend, one of his employees sued him in labor department. She had zero rights. It was 100% right. I owe nothing. She quit, and that's it. Well, well, I have to pay her after she quit. But she told him, it doesn't matter. If you don't pay me, I'll make your life hell. 
לא יארס, דיס, אנדר לא סוד. He told me I calculated how much the lawyer is going to cost me. Anyway, I would lose. I told her, let's make a settlement. I pay her, I don't know, 30,000, whatever, and it was over. Otherwise, it would be 100, and it would be years. And the lawyers will be tens of thousands of dollars. I'm 100% innocent, but what is the point? Do I want to be right and lose $200,000? Or do I want to be smart and lose 30? You get the point or no? That's what, it's, that's what life is all about in every, in every day of our life. It's with your tenant, it's with your neighbor, it's with your rabbi, it's with your people in your shul, it's with the cleaning lady. One wife told me, I see that my cleaning lady steals from me. But Baruch Hashem, she steals shtuyot. She steals soap, she steals laundry detergent. <laughs> The real thing she doesn't steal. She sees on the camera what she steals. So the, the cleaning lady, the Spanish woman, has a limited irat shamayim. <laughs> irat shamayim does not allow her to steal diamond rings and cash. So what does she steal? Things that she knows that if the owner will find out, she won't care. Yes, I, I took a little bit laundry detergent. I took uh, soap, bar soap. I took one bottle of shampoo. I stole a pair of socks <laughs> for her husband for his birthday. <laughs> Do you get the point or no? So you can be right. What? You're stealing from me. You're ungrateful. You witch. Get out of here. Pack your stuff. I'll sue you. Now you need three months to look for a new cleaning lady. <laughs> These three months will cause you to divorce. You drove your husband crazy. Oh, I can't take my life. I hate it. Find me a cleaning lady. What do you want from me? What do I know? Ah, I can't. I'm dying. Cancel all your family. They're not coming for Pesach. <laughs> all of that was for a bottle of shampoo. <laughs> so what's better, to be right or to be smart? You got your answer. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.